Good evening and welcome to the Monday, September 8, 2014 meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Could we please have the roll call from the town clerk? Chairman Sullivan? Here. Councilor Jordan? Here. Councilor McCausland? Here. Councilor Ray? Here. Councilor Sherman? Here. Councilor Wagner? Present. And Councilor Walsh? Here. May we please pledge our allegiance to the flag? flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any town council reports or correspondence? Seeing none, we'll go on to the next item. Uh, do we have a finance committee report, Chairman Walsh? Uh, no, Chairman have, of the Finance Committee Walsh. <laughs> <laughs> you have um, connected to your uh, packet today. You have uh, you have reports. However, we have one item on the agenda today, and that's a pay classification plan that will be presented. And I think I'd defer to it. In addition to that, um, uh, Councillor um, uh, Chair Sullivan and I have had contact with. Uh, chair as well as the finance chair of the school board relative to um, some of the capital stewardship plans that the schools have. We are planning to meet with them hopefully next week and then should have, a, um, have an agenda item for the December meeting. But uh, other than that, uh, nothing else to report. Thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, we have the opportunity for people, anyone wishing to discuss an item that is not on tonight's agenda. Is there anyone wishing to do so? Seeing no one, we'll move on to the next item, the town manager's monthly report. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman Sullivan. Uh, I did submit a report in writing this evening, uh, which, which is before you, and it's an update on what we've been doing for paving and drainage projects during calendar uh, during calendar year uh, 2014. And just want, want to briefly highlight it. Uh, all together uh, with what is planned uh, this year, it's about $1.3 million worth of uh, road and drainage improvements. Uh, there was a drainage project down on Shore Road, at Chimney Rock Road, that was about $130,000. Uh, the overlay of Route 77, probably best known out, out near the Beach to Beacon start line, uh, was $574,000, of which the state fortunately picked up 430, but the town paid 86,000. Spurwink Avenue was overlaid from Route 77 out to the golf course entrance. Uh, that was $101,107. Uh, Denison Drive, which is the road that goes into the recycling center, uh, that was a sort of a mess as you went in there. Some of you may have noticed that was paved $28,400. Uh, there were a couple of minor streets that were paved for $12,000. Uh, if any of you have been in the southern end of town lately, you, you might notice Charles Jordan Road, which is the road that heads from Sprague Hall all the way down to the entrance to the Sprague property where the Rams are on the post. That project is $250,000, all locally funded. Some of it was paved uh, today, some of it will be paved tomorrow. Uh, and we're still due uh, in the next month or two to overlay Sawyer Road from Eastman to Fickett, that's another $70,000, and Trundy Road from uh, going into Shore Acres, which is another $75,000. Anyway, $1.3 million, quite a bit of money, and you know, I really appreciate uh, Bob Malley's efforts in particular uh, on this, but uh, nothing is inexpensive these days. Uh, next, uh, in next year's budget, one of the major highlights is to do Old Ocean House Road from Route 77 to Route 77, where it loops around as, you know, if you're going to go to Shore Acres. And, and that's, I recollect, about 250000 as well. So uh, the, the money disappears fast when you put it on the ground. So thank you. Thank you. I noticed. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Chairman Sullivan, just a question for Michael. Uh, we did hear from a citizen this week, Michael, and you did a nice job of uh, responding to that. Very much appreciated. But can you highlight the basis for prioritizing the work 
Because yep. I think it's important to state again that there is a plan and there is some engineering behind it and some decision making that's done. So. Yeah, we have a, a thank you, Council Watch. We have a pavement management plan that was done. We had an outside consultant actually looked at all the roads, rated them. We also have a database that's available to anyone who would like to see it uh, that looks at every single road, how long it is, uh, what, it would, what we believe would cost to repave it, uh, when it was last repaved, and all, all of this is based on that. Drainage projects, the good news is that you know, if you look at this, this past uh, month, we had <coughs> a six inch. Uh, rainstorm in, in what was it two hours mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the work we've done on drainage over the years paid dividends in terms of you know not having the very upsetting reform calls as a result of us for example improving the drainage on shore road along chimney rock and further down and, and some others that we've done as well so it, it's all based on all the road works done on a pavement management plan plus we do try to you know for example the States doing, uh, excuse me, the water districts doing Scott Dyer Road, putting in uh, water lines there, and, and obviously I think if, when everyone sees that, while they're doing a fairly good job uh, fixing the trench, uh, you know that's a prime route for us, and that will probably go up the list some uh, because of all the different uh, cuts in it and, and some of the, the problems that exist in, in the rest of the road. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, the, the one other part of my report is I did want to mention. Uh, the passing this past month of Elizabeth Peterson. Uh, Elizabeth uh, was, a, was in her uh, 90s, I believe. Uh, she, I know it was 90s, I wanted to say late 90s, but I don't want to make her older than she, she was. But just a, a great woman. She lived for a long time down at Hanford Cove and then over on Father Road. But she was very instrumental in working with us with the Garden Club in getting the, the garden started at, when you, at, at Portland Headlight on the left as you go into the lighthouse itself. She worked with some some other, uh, some other members of the Garden Club to do that. And she also, some of you may be familiar with the Cape Elizabeth uh, Past and Present book that came out maybe 15 years ago, a new edition came out uh, in, in the last uh, year. And she was one of the prime authors of that. She was also a regular volunteer every Thursday over at the library at the Cape Elizabeth <coughs> Preservation Society's uh, uh, center there where they where they take care of municipal records as well as uh, some of their private collections. So just, just a great lady and uh, she'll be missed. So thank you. Thank you. And I just wanted to add um, with respect to the road um, work that's been done, you all got uh, in your packet uh, the town manager's capital stewardship plan for the next 10 years. And there are uh, items in there pointing to roads that are going to that plan to be addressed in the next 10 years so anyway okay thank you um, next item is review of the draft minutes of the August 11 2014 Town Council meeting is there a motion to approve the minutes so moved. council Ray is there a second Sorry. council Walsh is there any discussion errors omissions no? all those in favor it's unanimous. Okay. Next item is number 115, update from the Firing Range Committee. Uh, before we uh, begin that item, this is now an opportunity, opportunity for members of the public to speak to an agenda item. If there is anyone wishing to do so, you have a three minute limit and the total time for each agenda item is 15 minutes. Is there anyone wishing to speak to item number 115? Yes. Your name and address, please. Uh, Edward Nadeau, 9 Apple Tree Lane. Anyway, um, it's, it's well established that gun owners have, have the, the right to own and use their guns. Uh, however, we as residents, you also have the right to peace and quiet in our homes. Safety, of course, is a given. Now, the homes in our neighborhood were built in, in accordance with the residential zoning rules and regulations. I just, don't, I just want to know why we don't have the same rights um, as all other homeowners in town to peace and quiet in our homes. I mean, and I mean in our homes. I think I mentioned last week that I registered 80 dB at last 5 o'clock last Thursday afternoon, whatever it was, shotgun, and that was in my home. Went, ran the windows open, but anyhow. Um, the attorney that was brought in by the council 
several months ago, he, he, he opined that, that the gun club is, is grandfathered. Well, if, let, let's say the gun club does have the right to make unlimited noise with the, you know, the, their, their gun blast, then, then why was a neighborhood approved, to basically downstream, you know, you know downrange from a, an unregulated gun club? It, it's, you know, it, it's, it's, to me, it's obviously a contradiction. And counselors, I know you're between a rock and a hard place, and I know you've worked very hard on this for a while now. Um, and also the committee, the, the Environment Range Committee, it's, it's a task that I, that I don't have envy. Um, however, I do recognize this is the last chance, the only chance to get this right. So therefore, I'm opposed uh, to granting the, the, the exception that you're talking about tonight, and uh, I urge a professional noise and safety assessment to, keep, to you know, be performed even if the town has to pay for it. But it's something that absolutely must be done for the good of, for the good of all of us. Um, just don't want you to miss this opportunity that, uh, to ensure that any changes, I mean any changes to that gun range are, are to maximize safety and also minimize the sound and noise disruption to the neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Name and address, please. Hi, my name is Eric Frem. I uh, formerly of Cross Hill. I now live in Yarmouth. I do appreciate, I want to second Mr. Nadeau's comments. I do appreciate all the hard work you've spent on this, and I appreciate you letting me uh, come talk to you again. I'll try not to lecture. I, Could you move the microphone up? Sure. I'll just take this three minute opportunity to maybe ask the council, I think, you know, a year and a half into this, if, if this might be a good opportunity for you just to clarify to the community what noise standard you do plan to apply, because there's a lot of sort of contradictory information. The, you know, the new ordinance is pretty clear about the importance, the intent of minimizing noise impacts, but I still haven't gotten a sense from the council of what standard you plan to hold the club to. I still can't wrap my mind around. Um, the finding that I believe Mr. Cole inserted into the draft motion from the ordinance, this idea that even though there was a 1941, 1951, 1955 legislated peace, quiet, and good order standard in this town, he says, you know, the implication was that gun noise was somehow compliant with that standard, and I just can't wrap my mind around that idea, the idea that a gun range that wasn't even in existence, that wasn't approved, wasn't planned, no one knew where it would be, no one knew how loud, it, loud it would be, how large it would be, the idea that that club of the future was somehow pre-exempted from, you know, pretty, uh, pretty clear standard, a standard so strong that you later had to exempt agricultural and school activities from it. The idea that that club was, the club of the future would be pre-exempted from that standard just strikes me as crazy. I think it contravenes the letter, spirit, and revision history of your own law. And also the, the misunderstood 30A MRSA 3011, you know, that law that gets referred to so often as grandfathering the club, it really doesn't, it unambiguously, it's unambiguously deferential to the pre-existing noise ordinances of a town. Um, more than anything, that 30A MRSA 3011 validates the peace, quiet, and good order standard that was on the books here. Um, and I think for to this council to embrace Mr. Cole's implication that the gun noise was because the gunfire was legal, all the noise from it was legal, that contravenes the principle of 30A because if, if that were true, that all legal discharge of firearms, all that noise was legal, then 30A MRSA 3011 wouldn't be necessary. You know, th that law, I think the logical implication of that law is if a law for noise was on the books before 1995, it applied to gun noise. And I don't know why you won't embrace this town's good neighbor standards for gun noise or roosters, to be honest. But anyway, if you have an op I would just welcome any opportunity for you guys to just clarify what noise standard do you plan to judge the club by before you start exempting them from the legislated requirement that they provide a noise contour. Could we just clarify what standard does this council think applies? Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Jim Richard, Nine Cross Hill Road, Cape Elizabeth. I'm voicing my opposition to any action that fast tracks the printing process and circumvents the shooting range ordinance. Could you speak in there? Sure. 
In order to grant an exemption under Section 24-13-1 exceptions, the club must prove the ordinance has created a hardship. What hardship is created by the Spur Rink Rod and Gun Club having to wait for the issuance of building permits until they complete the proper relicensing process and have shown compliance with the regulations as outlined in Chapter 24? If any hardship has been created, it was created by the club. In 1955, the Spur Rink Rod and Gun Club was licensed by the town of Cape Elizabeth to open a firing range, quote, laid out in accordance with an approved NRA rifle range. The club has had 59 years to make safety improvements to keep current with NRA safety standards and willfully chose not to. Exemptions cannot be granted to an applicant for the mere convenience of the applicant. The town would have based the issuance of permits on a safety inspection that the town's own lawyer characterized as incapable of passing the straight face test, that former club club president Mark Mayone repeatedly refused to release, citing it would not be favorable to the club, on a safety inspection that was cursory and unsigned, and on construction documents that lack signatures and certifications. No other private landowner in the town of Cape Elizabeth would be granted permits to build an outhouse, let alone a firing range, under similar circumstances. All parties are entitled to due process. The town is obligated to practice due diligence. As part of their findings prior to the passage of Chapter 24, Cape Elizabeth Town Ordinances, on March 10, 2014, the town council ordered that an independent safety inspection of the firing range be completed by a qualified range inspector. To date, no such safety inspect inspection has been conducted. I would once again request the town council complete a real independent safety inspection of the spurring firing range before any further action pertaining to this issue is taken. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, John Baldwin at 47 Cross Hill Road. Um, I agree with everyone, and I'm against uh, providing any exception. But I think w one of the key things I've seen throughout being part of the process is we need a little more time to work out our differences. And I really think, as two groups, we can come together. If we start building in a month, it's not going to come together, and we're going to just go head to head until what we both sides feel is necessary to get done. So I think if we have a little more time to work through our differences, find a middle ground that's acceptable, and I think the firing range committee is working at that, and we just, I think we just need more time, we might be able to find a solution that's best for all. If we rush to build, um, that's not going to provide any benefit to the club or to the residents. And then we're all going to hire lawyers, we're all going to try to put this in a court. And that, that I think we can avoid. So uh, it might, might be worth considering. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. My name is Tammy Walter. I'm the president of the Sperwink Rod and Gun Club, and I live at 1095 Sawyer Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Um, I would like to encourage the council to pass this exception so that the Sperwink Rod and Gun Club can you speak into the mic? Just move it a little bit. Okay. Can you hear me now? That's better. Would you like me to start over? Uh, it's no, it's fine, I think. Okay. Um, now I don't know where I was. Okay. I'm just going to start over real quick because I only have a few sentences. Um, I would like to encourage the council to pass this exception so that the Sproink Rod and Gun Club can begin making improvements for the good of our neighbors, our community, and our members. We have delivered, in good faith, a range safety evaluation. Um, on behalf of the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club, I would like to thank the Council and the Firing Range Committee members for all your hard work. Thank you. My name is Ralph Romano, and I live at uh, 12 Tiger Lily Lane. While I agree with most of my neighbors, my concerned neighbors, about the activities at the Spur Rink Rod and Gun Club, I don't have a problem with you. I, I think in the ordinance as it's written now, there's been a, a catch-22 that's been built. In order to get a license, you require the club to take reasonable steps towards short, a shot containment. But they can't take any steps towards shot containment without a building permit. But they can't get a building permit without a license. But they can't get a license unless they get the permit. I mean, you're going to go round and around in circles here. It makes no sense. 
that's just clearly an oversight. I mean, it's the, the ordinance, okay, it was, it was written, and, and first time out of the gate, somebody just didn't get it quite right. And I don't think there's any problem with changing it. I mean, I think you have to give them a, a reasonable chance to perform, a reasonable chance to, to uh, you know, to make their improvements. Um, the, the other thing is that I would like to see, I don't know if you, I, th I thought you were going to discuss tonight whether or not the town should do, or somebody should do a, uh, a safety assessment on the range. And I don't, I've sent my email to you twice, I don't know, I don't have much confidence in the internet sometimes, so I sent it in two different ways. <clears throat> and as I said, I think the town has a responsibility to do a safety assessment. I mean, you've had a lot of red flags come up here. You've got police reports with bullets being fired into houses, and evidently the police went down and said, well, you can't prove it came from the Rod and Gun Club. But I mean, anybody with a little lick of common sense goes, you'd, you'd look around and you'd say, well, where are all the bullets being fired in this neighborhood, you know, anywhere near close? And, and it, it just seems to make simple common sense to, to look into it a little further and to see what the operations are down there, what it's being conducted. Otherwise, you're just flying blind. You're just assuming that everything's safe, everything's fine. But, but what kind of a red flag does it take for you to do a safety assessment? I mean, you don't have to have a body count or something. I mean, you, you know, you, you've got to be reasonable. You should look into this. The council is elected to look after the, the welfare of the people of Cape Elizabeth. That's your obligation. And if it costs you some money to do it, well, that's tough. You know, you spend the money to do it. I mean, that's your responsibility. That's why you were elected, to protect the people, to protect the public. And I don't think, I mean, nobody, you know, the, the, I agree with what the previous man said, that the uh, safety assessment that the Rod and Gun Club, it, it was pretty cursory. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't anything that I don't think anybody would have a great deal of confidence in. Certainly not the neighbors. I mean, when you talk to the rest of us, it didn't put anybody at ease that I know of. And the other thing is that if the neighbors, if we do it, I mean, we can raise the money, we can have our own assessment, but like I said, I don't think the Rod and Gun Club's going to buy it. They aren't going to say it. The only one here that's neutral is the town. Thank you, Mr. Romano. Your time is up. Could you wrap, wrap it up if you have just a sentence to finish or something? Well, like I said, the town, I believe the only one that, that, ha that, that can do it and, and, and look reasonably unbiased is the town. And the town has that obligation, and I wish you would do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Kathy Klein, 66 Crossell Road. I just wanted to clarify one thing. There were several of the town councilors at the workshop last week that expressed a lot of frustration that neighbors had gotten in, way, in the way of the grant application. Um, I myself did not contact the Department of Inland Fisheries, but I just want to clarify that it wasn't, I don't think that neighbors did that because they simply had a vendetta against the club. I think it's important to know that people are concerned about shot containment and now the grant application calls for opening the club to public hours. So unless we're really, um, it, unless people um, are, um, uh, unless they're, um, feel confident that there's shot containment, it's more worrisome that the club is going to be open to the public because it's not, right now we've been told about, you know, the long process that the club goes through in terms of approving members and, um, you know, interviewing members to make sure that they're responsible in their shooting practices. But if we're opening it to the public, then that, you know, it's a, it's a much different conversation. And I think it's understandable that people would be nervous um, when shot containment is a question and we're talking about opening it to the public. And I think um, looking at it as just being a simple, the neighbors having a vendetta at the club, it oversimplifies the issue. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. This, this will be our last uh, comment, commentator. We're almost out of time. Well, I'll be brief. Um, I'm not opposed to the council. Your name and address, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Rich Moran, 62 Cross Hill. I'm not opposed to the council making a change to their uh, processes. Uh, the only thing I'm concerned about in this process is it's not clear to me that if an exception to your practices are granted, 
uh, what will be the improved outcome versus you not granting this exception. Uh, sound has to be considered in any of the outcomes because that's causing a lot of the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Unless there's council objection, I'm going to close the public comment session as we've reached our 15 minutes. Okay. This, I'm sorry, Mr. Mann. Unless the council wants to make an exception. No. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Mann. Okay. Um, okay. Item number 115, update from the Firing Range <coughs> Committee. Um, the uh, chairman of the Firing <coughs> Range Committee, Councilor Jamie Wagner, has forwarded this, these uh, uh, I'm having a brain cramp. Um, request for exception. Request for exceptions <laughs> to us. So let me uh, turn this over to Council Wagner, and he can explain the whys and the wherefores. Okay. So first, I'll explain the genesis of the request for the exception, which is it's really a timing issue because uh, we live in a cold weather zone. Um, soon, the the ground will be too hard to um, commence construction activities. So it was just an attempt to have the ability to conduct construction activities this fall if the Firing Range Committee deems it appropriate. <coughs> so um, let me dig in a little deeper. Um, the ordinance permits uh, the town council to grant exceptions based on hardship. Uh, you heard Mr. Richards' uh, comments on hardship. Uh, to explain what the hardship would be in this situation, there's a registration process and an application process that requires proof of shot containment. Uh, if we don't allow a firing range to make improvements, it would make it very difficult indeed for such range to ever achieve shot containment. So that's the thinking behind it, that you, know, you can't ever get to the point of achieving shot containment unless you're allowed to make the improvements. Um, it's also consistent with the authority that the ordinance grants the town council to uh, accept phased applications. <coughs> so the, the, the Article 13, Section 24, 13, 1 is the part that speaks to exceptions. Having addressed the hardship issue, then the request, then you come to the council and say what exception you're seeking. Um, what the firing range committee submitted to the town council for their consideration was that we wanted to give the authority to the firing range committee to review a completed safety uh, let me back up for a second the code enforcement officer of the town cannot grant uh, an application pursuant pursuant to this ordinance until there's a completed application submitted now that would also include the processing of that application which requires a public hearing so if we're going to go through a public hearing process, we definitely are not, uh, for the entire application, we're definitely not going to be able to commence any construction this year. So it'd probably be May or June of next year before we get to do so, or before the club gets to do so. So um, what we're requesting of the council as a committee, fire range committee, is to have the ability to review a completed safety evaluation that we review and that we approve as a firing range committee and to retain an expert in the best practices for firing ranges and that's that expert is determined by the firing range committee we have reviewed the qualifications of said expert and along with the that expert and the, the full firing range committee we would review and approve or not approve the, the design for the firing range and there have been preliminary designs submitted to the firing range committee concerning the baffling system, which would at least ostensibly achieve shot containment. You know, I'm not an expert, but this would be in conjunction with an expert. So what we're requesting from the council is to give the firing range committee the authority to review <clears throat> these safety evaluation and design plans, and if we're satisfied, to then say to the code enforcement officer, we're okay with this if their, the rest of their uh, construction requests are compliant with other town ordinances, you are free to grant them if you're satisfied. If we're not okay with it, we tell the code enforcement officer, we're not okay with this, don't grant any permits. 
So that's that's a, that's in a nutshell. I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you, Councilor. Questions, comments. Just Councilor Sherman. Uh, pre preliminarily, uh, Jamie, is this uh, was this a motion that the firing range committee approved as a whole? Uh, I mean, I, I confess I have not had a chance to see your minutes, but is, is this something that the committee is asking as a committee to the council? It, it is a committee approved. It was unanimous. Um, committee member Klein was there by telephone, so she couldn't vote because she wasn't there in person, but it was approved unanimously with the members present. The, I, I, I get the need to have uh, somebody with expertise <clears throat> reviewing the uh, safety evaluation. I, I wouldn't be qualified to do that, and I'm assuming there are very few people on the committee that are qualified. Um, what I'm struggling with a little bit is you, you get that peer review and or, or that expert to come in and offer his or her expertise that the, the <clears throat> plans are would create a safe firing range. What discretion do you think the committee would have at that point if the, if the peer reviewing person, the expert says, this is compliant with these various safety guidelines and, and I think they're good. And I'm not saying this very articulately, articulately but what, what would the committee do at that point? I, mean, we, I think we'd still, we'd still have the authority to reject or approve it. Um, you might be inclined, if you think this person is well qualified, to then say, okay, I'm satisfied. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but we'd be under no obligation to, to accept it just because a peer review said he thought it was okay. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you this, I'm, this kind of got flipped on its head. I was expecting that the neighbors of the gun club would have been supporting this, and the gun, <laughs> gun club would have been opposed to it, but it turned the other way around. Um, because my goal as the chair of the, the committee was to just speed things up so that we could have safety practices in place that would achieve shock. That, that was the goal. And I, I totally understand where the neighbors are coming from and the gun club. Maybe, maybe the neighbors in the gun club want to talk and say, I think it'd be better for both of us not to do this at this point. You know, that's, that's fine too. If they, if they don't want to proceed at this point, I'm not going to throw the hammer down and say you have to. You know, it's, uh, it has developed differently than I would have expected. Mm. Um, but I understand the rationale behind the neighbor's concern because if you're going to do it, good, Dave, the idea is that you probably want to do it as best as you can, <clears throat> right. Council Wagner? I'm sorry, Council Walsh? Uh, just, uh, Jamie, um, you know, I, I, I was at that meeting on that Friday, so I, I see where you see how it flipped completely, and I think a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the emails to the state <laughs> sort of wanted to put a stop to the spending of $28,000 to do these kinds of things. I wondered, um, now that we've had our chance to, to have a workshop, and discussed the whole issue about a safety, um, you know, sort of reviewing a safety evaluation or, or getting a safety evaluation done by the town. I wonder, given what you have in front of us, whether there might be the possibility of amending that. So you're going to review what they have presented to you, which was a week ago Friday, having I guess you have a meeting tomorrow night, either accept it or not. But the possibility of then having in your approval tonight the ability to hire your own safety expert, which may be covered under the best practice piece, but I wondered if you might want to consider that. I, I just put it out there because, again, I think that the general consensus I got from the workshop was that we're supportive of providing you um, what you need to get that document in in a comprehensive way by the then said you know experts that will convince you that what you have in front of you is in fact uh, the baseline safety for this club club to build or to add to or to improve or whatever. I just I just wonder if this is the time to get that approval especially because your original point was it was a timing issue. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, from my perspective, I just throw that out there. I'm not asking for an amendment. I'm just suggesting to you, is this the time to maybe modify that? I don't know. I've got, I've got a question, too, uh, Council Wagner. Uh, 
I understand that the, the club has, the gun club has formally submitted a safety range evaluation. Yeah. Has the firing range committee accepted it or rejected it or what have they done with it? We, we've only received it uh, at, during the course of the last meeting and it's on the agenda item to discuss it, I think, tomorrow. Wednesday. 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 Okay. Councillor Sherman. And I'm going to return to the point that I made at the workshop, which is, you know, I sort of compare this process to say how the planning board re would review an application. And members of the planning board typically aren't engineers, they're not architects, some of them are lawyers often, but they're not <clears throat> necessarily adept at reviewing plans and figuring out whether they're compliant with an ordinance or not. And it would seem to me the firing range committee needs it's an expert to do a peer review of the safety evaluation or perhaps just an independent evaluation, and maybe they end up being the same thing. But it's typically the town that hires that expert. The planning board, its seven members, doesn't go out and hire its own expert. Uh, the town has a town engineer that's basically on retainer, if I'm correct. Uh, and we have that individual do the, mm -hmm. the reviews of the applications. And it seems to me <coughs> you may want to utilize a comparable procedure here. That way, to harken back to a comment, I think, from the last gentleman who spoke, I think it was Mr. Romano, we're not going to, there's not going to be a fear that the, the so-called expert is, uh, gee, that there were enough people who favored the Cross Hill folks that they got their way or sure. the gun club got its way. It's, it's the town that does that. And that could be through some sort of the standard RFP process. And we may assign that task to the town manager or, I mean, I think that's what we typically do. So I would throw that idea out there. Yeah. I mean, I agree with both Jim and Dave's comments, and I think we had somewhat of a consensus at the workshop about this. So I think it makes sense to hire an independent safety evaluator. Maybe it might be the same person that's also the design expert yeah. you know, on fire range right. committees, so you can get you know, the two different parts of it uh, achieved. I don't know whether or not we should go with Jim's idea. I'm not opposed to it, but whether we make that part of the request for exception or we just treat it independently, which is, hey, let's just authorize Mike to go and hire uh, this individual we're talking about, hmm. and that we would go ahead and use that individual as the, uh, the, the completed safety evaluation. It doesn't say which safety evaluation. You know, hmm. we, we could say a new independent. I'm not opposed to that. Yeah. OK. Uh, Councilor Sherman? I just have a question for the town manager as to how that process would work for, for this scenario? Uh, yes, uh, Councilor Sherman. It, it would work in a number of ways. Uh, one, you'd have to indicate that you desire for it to happen. Uh, two, once we get back a proposal, you'll, you, we had a sense of the money. You, you would, we just don't have that money. Uh, we have money, but we don't have it appropriated for that purpose. So we'd have to provide a little bit of money for that. <clears throat> uh, you know, I, I would, you know, issue a, Request for proposals. Uh, I'd get, try to get a little guidance working with Jamie and others on how to do that. Uh, we'd then get proposals back. I would probably try to bring a couple of people in to review them with me, who who would be sort of recognized as folks that uh, would be might be on opposing mm -hmm. interests in this particular topic, and then uh, you know try to reach a consensus and hire a, a, a firm or an individual uh, to do this work. Council Walsh? So from a, from a council administrative point of view, since Michael just explained what you would do, how would you incorporate that into what Jamie has presented on behalf of his committee to have that done? Is there a way to tighten it up or expand on the language? Or I, I'm just j right. trying to get some direction here because, again, if time is of the essence relative to uh, winter conditions and so forth. Not sure. Uh, okay. Um, Councillor Jordan. Just on what Mike explained, does that mean we have to direct you tonight and then wait till next meeting to appropriate the funds? Do we have to what? Direct him to research it tonight and then wait till next meeting to appropriate the funds or could we mm -hmm. ask the Rod and Gun Club if they have any idea how much an expert might cost and we could Kind of throw out a number tonight. <clears throat> Up to number tonight, maybe. Well, whatever you want. <laughs> well, one one thing that that I was wondering is in in this scenario, would we need to have a formal request from the fire range committee to proceed with that or not? I'm asking the town manager. I'm not really sure. I don't know. 
you know, uh, I was going to say through the chair, but the chair asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, I think it's it's sort of understood that the firing range committee feels it needs expertise, it needs it needs outside expertise. You know, I think the council would vote it. I I have, you know, if, if the firing range committee opposed to it, I think they could meet later in the week and, and communicate back, and I'd put the process on hold. Uh, but you know, I, I I get the sense that that they'd like some expertise to work with them. Yeah. So. Yeah. Councillor Ray, did you have, I'm sorry, I thought I saw your hand. I think maybe she had her hand up. I just had a question on the procedures. Well, um, do we need to maybe ask the Ron and Gun Club if they will allow us onto their property to do a safety evaluation? Good question. Well, Councillor Ray? Um, I think I'll, I'll just uh, jump in with some of my thoughts. Um, First of all, um, I did review the minutes from the meeting um, that the Firing Range Committee had, and so I was a little unclear that they had actually requested the exception. Um, on the exception, there's two pieces, and um, I, at the workshop, which we're all aware of, I indicated some concerns about um, using town funds, and I say town funds because they're not town funds, they're taxpayer dollars. And so I indicated that I had some concerns about that. I am always concerned about taxpayer dollars, and I'm clear about my responsibilities to the town. Um, however, uh, I am concerned that we need to move forward with this, and I think it's important that we have a safety evaluation, so I will support that. Um, at the same time, I think it's important that the town council is the one that requires the that that uh, requires the safety evaluation and the safety evaluation um, is reported to the town council um, I, I, the firing range committee needs to be in that loop but i think we also need to be clear on if the safety evaluation comes in um, what is the expectation at the end of that process I don't want to get into a position where the safety evaluation comes in and uh, the two groups are now in conflict about how they feel about that safety evaluation. Um, well, we think it was good, we think it was bad, and now we're, we're stuck again. So I think it's very important that we craft how we're going to do this appropriately. Um, the second piece, the, uh, the section B, an expert in best practices, um, it, it, and, and I could be wrong, and, and maybe Council Wagner can correct me, but um, it seemed to me that that was a, a different request. And I, um, I looked at it, I went back over the ordinance, and it seems to me that that might potentially be a change to the ordinance, and so I want to sort of get some clarification on that, because if we're going to look at changing the ordinance, um, it's got to go back to the ordinance committee and... Um, I think that that again um, maybe delays um, where we're trying to go. And I say where we're trying to go because I think everybody's trying to go somewhere um, maybe in different directions. But I think it's important that we try to move forward and, and recognizing that this is a difficult issue. So um, that's my two cents. Okay, Councilor McCausland. Yeah, I think similarly to Councilor Ray, I agree. I do think we need to move forward with the safety evaluation. I think the town does need to take some responsibility for putting that in place. Um, I do share the same concern that Councilor Ray expressed. I think we have to anticipate it's not going to be, what's the word, easy sledding. It, it's it's going to be hard. We have two <coughs> parties with different agendas and and. Um, we haven't been down this path before, and it will take some patience and some um, forbearance, I think, on both parties' sides. But I think we have to do it, and I think that we have the ability to get that done. I, I like what you proposed. I am a little bit concerned about the timing on um, pulling all of that together. I'm also concerned that the folks at the gun club understand if we move forward with this 
um, proposed item number 115, uh, which I think, am I clear when I say, I think what they are looking to do is to address some of the potential safety concerns, that if we move forward with this exception, the uh, committee grants them their approval or the code enforcement officer grants that approval. When the independent safety inspection is done, there may still be other things that will need to get addressed. Or that there's the potential that some of the things that they are proposing to do for this exception won't meet the requirement of the new safety evaluation. And I, I want to make sure everybody's clear that that is obviously a potential. I, I have a couple ideas and perhaps some solutions to our, I don't know, just how to, how to organize our, our approach to this. Um, is, and I just want to direct this mainly to Council Wagner because he's chairman of the Fire and Range Committee. In reviewing all this, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the requirements for the registration are shock containment and warning signs. Warning signs, I understand, have been, uh, that requirement has been met, deemed to be met. Right. Shock containment is not yet. Right. The gun club is trying to do that. They've been held up. But that, those, are the, those are the requirements for registration. Correct. Those are the only requirements for registration. Not the only. Site plan. There is also the noise contours. Uh, there's a site plan requirement as part of the okay. registration okay. that has... Now, Five components. Okay, so the safety range evaluation is not a requirement for registration. Is it a requirement for the application? Yes, there yes. must be a completed safety evaluation. For the application? Yes. For which they have one year. Okay. Right. So we could, ostensibly, I'm just trying to organize our thoughts here, we could uh, allow the permit building permit to go through, to go forward, as an exception, um, which would allow them to proceed with shot containment, which is their registration. They've got to be registered before they can submit an application. And so the range safety evaluation can come after that. I mean, I, I, I will say that I'm in support of the town moving forward with that. I'm just trying to organize our our plan with, with what we have before us tonight, because it's going to affect, you know, whether or not we use the first paragraph that you've presented, maybe we only use the second, maybe we wait on that, I, I don't know, so anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I would be hesitant to grant the code enforcement officer authority to get building permits unless we were satisfied as a committee yeah. that safety issues were adequately addressed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So that, that means you're assuming that safety, safety requirements would be, or let me just put it this way, would there be other safety requirements beyond shock containment? Shock containment's, you know, the, the, the meat of this ordinance, okay. you know, the, the, for safety. Okay. But, but there could be. There could be other safety could requirements. Be. I, I'm just looking, if we're going to hire some, a safety expert to well, look at the range, I think we're going to look at not just shock Sure. Okay. It includes signage, fencing, yeah. things like that. Yep. Mm. Councilor McCausland? Um, I have a question in response to what you just said, and that is, would we anticipate that our safety evaluator would be looking at operations within the confines of the gun club, or yeah. only how those operations affect those outside of the gun club? Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, obviously, it is a proven time after time, not an expert in this area. Uh, you know, I, I, I would, you know, first of all, I'd probably have someone like the town engineer look at, with me at helping to prepare a request for proposals to make sure it's comprehensive and they're just more experienced at that than I am. Uh, secondly is, you know, I would look toward the, you know, for example, the, the, the NRA uh, does have safety manuals, safety regulations, that look at a whole host of different things. And I think you, you, while that would not be the sole thing we would look at, we would look at the standards that the NRA itself has for, for, new, for particularly for new rangers 
as to you know what are the safety requirements that there ought to be in an outdoor shooting range. So and, and those probably you know again others have seen those regulations. I haven't. Uh, you know it's not just shot containment. I'm sure there's a whole host of, of different things in that in that uh, doc, in those documents. And and my concern then is how involved we as a town or as the members of the council want to be involved in their operations inside of their own confines. Can I answer that? Yes, please. You know, I, I look at this, I think you've delegated most of the review of this to the firing range committee. And I think like you you oversee any committee, you've sort of given this committee quasi judicial powers to, to issue permits, uh, you know, along with the with the code enforcement officer. So I would think the council itself would not be all that involved except for the members of the, the fire range committee, who council members who happen to serve on it. I think you've, you've really given them the responsibility to do the reviews and to, to make the determinations that, that this, the, the safety plans are adequate, uh, you know, before the, they, you know, as indicated, uh, before the building inspector actually goes ahead and gets a permit. And, and I, my sense is, you know, that what, what Councillor Wagner and the committee have presented this evening is an attempt to accomplish that. Did you, Councillor Wagner, did you? Uh, if I'm to understand Molly, um, part of her question was whether or not we should be involved at all of looking at the safety inside the range amongst the, the shooters. I mean, oh. I think. I mean, I know there was an incident within the last two weeks where a young girl uh, tragically shot an instructor and he passed away. Uh, not obviously not in Maine. I'm not saying Maine. In, in, in another state, in another state, there was a young girl who was nine years old who, whose parents, you know, tragically thought it was okay for her to shoot an Uzi, and uh, you know she didn't have enough control and shot off and killed the instructor next to her. So that would raise a safety issue about inside of a, a club. You know, um, I, I don't think that those types of guns are allowed in the Spur and Broadway Club. Um, but it does beg the question of are there, are there any sorts of guns that a child would be too young to <coughs> hold or, you know, and that might be something that the, this ordinance would speak to as far as <coughs> safety evaluation in general. Just, just, you know, uh, yes. You know, I don't want to prejudge what the safety evaluator might recommend, right. which is another way of answering the question. Uh, you know, if, if there are operations within a rod and gun club, an outdoor shooting range, uh, that are generally accepted ways of doing things, and they're operational, I think that that ought to be included as part of the report in the fire shooting <coughs> range committee ought to look at. Councilor Sherman? I mean, what we continue to hear both from the Cross Hill residents, residents around town, as well as the folks from the gun club is they want this to be as safe of a facility as possible. We're hearing from the committee that they need an independent evaluation. So however we work that into this request for exceptions, I'm willing to support that. Uh, I do think time is of the essence. If we had a sense that such an evaluation would range from Five to ten thousand dollars. I have no idea, but perhaps we could even consider a motion that of up to X thousand dollars, so that we wouldn't have to come back here for another vote next month, and that would allow the town manager to begin the process. If it turns out we're way off base with that, then obviously you will need to talk to us again next month. But I'd like to get that going, and I, I honestly, I'm just having a hard time figuring out how it fits into this request for exceptions, other than perhaps we just simply state that. The code enforcement officer can issue the permits, et cetera, et cetera. If there is a uh, completed safety evaluation that has been performed at the request of the town of Cape Elizabeth and is submitted, and that has been submitted as part of the license application, I, mean, I think that's what we're all, we're all contemplating. That safety evalu evaluation comes out and it says these seven things are fine, but these five other items have to be addressed. Then, presumably, as part of the final application process, the club will figure out a way to address those last five items. Um, so to me, that's how I see this going. Um, Councilor Ray. The only thing that I, I agree with Councilor Sherman, the only thing that I want to be um, assured of is that when we get the safety, say we get the safety evaluation, and let's assume that everything's fine. I, I, I won't, we can assume that things need to be addressed and they're addressed. I want to make sure that we then are not at a place where um, 
uh, people are going to um, dispute and, and, and go back and forth about the safety evaluation. If we have a safety evaluation and it has been, um, say, say, it's, say it, the safety evaluation is fine, don't want this to be a new thing to debate by um, people in the fire range committee, people in town, so forth and so on. So I, I, what I guess what I'm trying to say is when we work out the wording, I want to make sure that if the safety evaluation is done and it is satisfactory, it is now behind us and we're moving forward with whatever the next piece of the puzzle is. Does that make some sense? Mm -hmm. I might, yeah, Councilor Walsh. Uh, I, I'm not so sure you can guarantee that, Kathy. Um, I'm not looking for a guarantee. No, but I'm not looking for a guarantee. I'm looking for um, no, not another stumbling block or another place to start throwing uh, bombs that, oh, we have the safety evaluation. Well, yeah. he said this, but I don't think I like that. And he said that, and I don't think I like that. I want some kind of um, understanding that there is an acceptance of the safety evaluation if, in fact, it, is, it either comes back as it's fully safe or it comes back and there's things to be done and those things are done. So now it is fully safe. But, if, but if, yeah. if Michael does, excuse me, let me finish with the, because the conversation okay. we had started. If, if Michael takes it and deals with it with the guidance from the engineering firm, talking with experts, if in fact there are some, and creates an RFP that is acceptable to the firing range committee, which is really our delegate in this, in this situation, we've, we've given them the authority. It goes out to bid and then the evaluation is completed. Obviously, we've talked with Caitlin here whether, in fact, they'll allow us into the facility to do the evaluation. And it comes back with whatever report is generated, clearly more than just one page, which is what was submitted to us last week at your meeting. Um, two pages, OK. A full page and just a, a brief paragraph on the second page. Um, but it, it, even if it, it does determine things are safe and it comes up with all the rationale in the world for why, there still will be at the firing range committee, I'm sure, and from the public, questions. And those questions need to, to, to vet themselves through the normal process. But I think the mere fact that we're taking this, or at least supporting you, because it's not real yet, supporting the firing range committee to go forward with it, I think is a huge, huge step to getting this moved to where we want it to go, which is to get some resolution. I, did you want to just to raise this? I, I don't disagree with anything you're saying. What I don't want to see is <clears throat> that that report is generated, and now we've got a group that says, well, you know, I don't think I really like that person, and I don't think they're really qualified because it's not going their way. Or somebody else says, well, you know, I think they're really great because it's going their way. I just am trying to find a way that maybe there's some kind of wording in how we do it. I'm not saying people aren't going to talk sure. about it or discuss it or whatever. Mm -hmm. I just don't want it to turn into a new stumbling block. Sure. Okay. I think Councilor Sherman was next. Well, and to one of the earlier points, that's why I think we're agreeing with what one of the commentators has said, I think it was Mr. Romano, I've now I've quoted him twice, that the town ought to select that uh, evaluator. Uh, then you avoid that uh, sense that one side or the other got its way. Um, so I really do think it ought to be a town driven uh, process. And you know, again, having sat on the planning board for six years, we got peer reviews with every application and you've got to rely on the citizen members of those committees to take the expertise that they're given into account when they're making their decisions. And I would be very surprised if a committee just said, oh, I'm going to disregard what the experts say and I'm going to implement what I believe. Uh, if you have a basis for that, that's one thing. But <clears throat> I think committee members do defer to experts in most respects. Thank you. Councilor Mukasa. Yeah, I have two comments I'd like to make. One in response to that, Dave. I'm, I'm only concerned that the implication is that if it is a safety evaluation that's done uh, by and for the town, that the 
um, expectation then is going to be that all of those recommendations therefore need to be implemented just as they would be, for example, if we were doing an engineering study on a roadway or a building improvement, for example. No different. So uh, I see this coming back to the council again. If we go out with an RFP, we come back with someone's proposal that says they're going to provide us with these services. We agree that we're going to accept their proposal, move forward, they do the evaluation, they come back with 10 recommendations. I, I'm not clear that we as a council then will have determined that we're accepting those 10 um, recommendations as written, or do we have a further discussion about them? Or does the committee have a further discussion? And can I make one other comment on paying for it? I actually don't have a problem paying for that evaluation for the first time because this is new territory. I don't want to end up in a situation where we determine in the future that we'd like to have, for example, an annual safety evaluation done and it's done at the taxpayer's expense. I think just as in any um, building project, for example, that outside engineer builds the town, and I think if I'm correct, uh, I think the manager will correct me if I'm wrong, the town then charges those expenses back to the applicant, which in this case would be the gun club. Um, uh, Mike, do you want to? I think this council is want to speak out for. Okay. Did, did anyone else have anything to say? I mean, I think that evaluation goes back to the committee. Yeah. Uh, and if there are 10 recommendations, but one of them costs a half a million dollars <clears throat> and would only improve safety by an incremental amount, the committee may say, well, that's too much of a hardship. And we believe these other measures that are far cheaper will go a lot, way, a lot further to making the gun club more safe. So we're going to recommend these. Um, but we're, we're just not going to know. We really can't control what the recommendations are going to be or what the, how the committee is going to react to it. I think we just have to rely on the job that the ordinance is drafted and we have to rely on them to act in good faith. I, I uh, have a comment. I, I actually, um, I'd like to mention that I agree with Councilor Ray in um, part of the language of the first paragraph uh, noted on section B and expert and best practices for firing ranges as determined by the firing range committee. I think that's new language for the ordinance. Um, <coughs> there, is a, there is a section that addresses best management practices with, res with respect to lead abatement, but in, in, but in no other place in the ordinance. So to me, that's problematic in that it is brand new language and should come back from the ordinance, ordinance committee. So I would be very interested in striking that. Um, and then also, I'm wondering if what we ought to do is just decide on whether or not we are, if we want to proceed with any part of what we have in front of us, if we decide if we could or should decide on the second section first because that's basically asking for uh, uh, the range committee to to grant basically asking for the authority to grant extensions that's very clear and simple it seems to me anyway so I'm wondering if if we should divide this item or if we can have an agreement on we accept part of it as it's written, perhaps yeah, the separate it was part. my intent to make them as two separate requests. Okay. So two, two exceptions. You know, because we're really spending our time on the top part, and maybe, but I was, I was wondering with council's permission, maybe we <coughs> think about separating the two, or, you know, if, every, if everyone could take a moment and look at that second section, um, and if there, if anyone has any issues with that, maybe we could get that out of the way and then finish up our, our conversation on the top half. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm, I'm fine with it as drafted. The second The second. Second section. Paragraph. Any? Yeah, Ray? Yep. Okay. Anyone else? And fine. Just, okay. Just, if, if I might, yep. uh, yes. pr procedurally, you know, th there are nine findings that you need to make as part of the motion. In, 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 so if you're going to be handling these separately, there's no motions on the table yet, I don't believe. Yeah, that's correct. When, when someone does move these, you need to be sure that you, you include the nine findings uh, as part of the motion. I mean, the nine findings, if I may ask, that are uh, the uh, exceptions? That are listed in, the uh, 24, in the 13, 1 and 24, 13, 2. 
Well, then, then I might suggest then, Council Wagner, if you if you are not prepared or if you have not have those ready to list. No, I, I could do it tonight. I mean, right now. I could just do it right now. Um, wouldn't we need to see that in writing in advance as material? I mean, just just procedurally, I. It was in the packet. It was, it was, in the packet. It was, oh, the, the, it was a list, the list of list exceptions. Of, yeah, and, it, and it's just <laughs> it saying, like, it's just how section 24.13.1, yeah. um, okay. findings 1 through 5, and 24.13.2, findings 1 through 4, have been adequately addressed. Therefore, I move these two exceptions. Okay. I think that, that would be sufficient. I don't think I need to read them. Oh, you know, I cited to the section of the ordinance. Okay, then let me ask the town clerk then if she's got that for the minutes. Maybe you could repeat that. <clears throat> Just if I, yeah, it, it, in granting an exception, the municipal officers shall find, in addition to the above hardship, that the requirements of section 24. I think when you, when you read that, shall find in addition to the above hardship, it does imply that you need to have findings on the nine points. And some of these points simply can state them. Uh, the, the hardship is related to a specific shooting range facility involved, predates the adoption of, the, the, pre predates the adoption of this ordinance. I just, you know, whatever you do, this is a very uh, controversial area, and I just think it's important that you follow the procedure that's recommended in the ordinance. Okay. I mean, I'm happy to read it in. I mean, uh, okay. so... Is that the will of the council that I do that at this moment, or? Well, let's have that discussion. Is the council comfortable with Councillor Wagner reading the ex exceptions, their citations for the ordinance, or would the council prefer to have those in written form? I think the town manager is making a very good point. Councillor Sherman? I mean, I, if, if what Jamie is prepared to do is simply read these verbatim, I'm not, what I'm hearing from the town manager is that's not going to really satisfy uh, the required findings under these two sections in order to grant an exception. Well, you know, there's three lawyers sitting at this table, and I'm not one of them. <laughs> uh, but when you say that something results in a hardship, generally, I think you need to indicate what that hardship is. If you, if you reference that it's related to the specific shooting range facility involved and predates the adoption of this ordinance, you know, I would think that there'd need to be a little bit of explanation as to, you know, there just needs to be a little more verbiage. I mean, I, I'm prepared to do that. Okay. Councilor Jordan? I think we're videotaping it, so we'll be able to write it down verbatim. So we'll have it written. I mean, I'll, I'll articulate myself as best as possible, but I, I think, <clears throat> you know, as I stated before, I think I explained what the hardship was, and I'll incorporate that into what, uh, what I'll say right now. Well, before you start, Council Wagner, I'd like to get a better consensus of that. Is there any more, is there any more comment on consensus of that again? I mean, I, I have no doubt that Council Wagner is more than capable to cite these, to make these citations. What concerns me is that as this is a brand new ordinance, this is a very controversial issue. I'm concerned that it that it perhaps needs to be in writing. But I would like I will acquiesce to the will of the council. Councillor Sherman, I, if Jamie Wagner is prepared to make the motion, I'm certainly willing to listen to it and see if I'm satisfied as a member of the council that he's addressed these nine items. And if we feel like there needs to be more fleshing out, we can always table the motion. Okay. So if he's willing to do it, I. I'm happy to hear it. If we don't try Jamie's approach, then we're just going to have to wait a month until next meeting when they can be prepared and presented. So the kind of point of doing it would be lost because we're here for time sensitivity and waiting a month just to write down what Jamie might be able to accomplish verbally seems kind of silly. Well, I don't agree with you, Council Jordan, but I certainly would like to promise to proceed. It just concerns me that it be careful because it has weighty consequences, Council Walsh? Uh, six years on the zoning board, um, so uh, very often the findings of fact are determined at the hearing, at the time. So in some ways, 
we're kind of acting in the same fashion here, and I don't think it's that different than what we've experienced at the zoning levels. So to some degree, if Councillor Wagner is, is, is willing to make the motion, I'm willing to listen to it and evaluate it against the standard that's in place. And again, like Dave Sherman indicated, if we don't want to go move on, move on it, we'll just we'll delay it to the next meeting. But I'm all for listening to it, but you know, zoning board does this every meeting. Thank you, Council Wall. Okay, Council Wagner. Okay. Bear with me. <laughs> All right, pursuant to section 24.13.1, exceptions. Um, in this individual case, I believe there should be a finding of a hardship to the Spurwick Broad and Gun Club resulting from the applications of this ordinance because the ordinance requires um, in the registration process that shot containment be addressed. Um, the hardship, uh, shot containment has not been addressed adequately at this point. Um, the ordinance requires that it be addressed within 90 days of the effective date of the ordinance. Um, the hardship, this hardship results from the application of this ordinance, which only became effective in April of this year. This hardship is related to the specific shooting range, um, that being the Spur, Spur Rodden Gun Club, uh, whose um, operation predated the adoption of this ordinance that addresses one, two, and three of the exceptions. This hardship was not self-induced or self-created Following the effective date of this ordinance, this is something that was put upon the gun club by the adoption of this ordinance. And this hardship is peculiar to the specific shooting range uh, facility involved, which is the only shooting range facility in the town of Cape Elizabeth. Um, those are the five uh, subsections of the <coughs> exception requirement. There's Four additional findings that must be made pursuant to ordinance under section 24.13.2. Um, the unique conditions pertaining to the Spurwick Broad and Gun Club um, apply because of its history, which as we know uh, <clears throat> spans more than 50 years. It's um, Topography, which is adjacent to uh, densely populated uh, development in Cape Elizabeth. That's number one. Number two, a literal interpretation of the provisions of the ordinance would deprive the applicant of its rights to operate the existing shooting range facility because the ordinance requires shot containment, which the gun club is not yet able to achieve given its current configuration. Uh, number three, the requested exception would not materially affect the safety of the surrounding neighborhoods um, or the general public welfare, as the requested exception is actually drafted in order to enhance the safety of the surrounding neighborhoods and the general public. And four, the exception requested is the minimum needed to allow continued use of the shooting range in question. Um, if literally interpreted, the shooting range could be padlocked because shot containment is not achieved by the 90-day registration requirement. So we're asking for an exception based on um, allowing them to proceed with the safety improvements and to address the safety uh, requirements necessary in order to <coughs> achieve shot containment. That's five plus four. Thank you. Any comments? Suggestions? Do you need a second? Is there a second? I'll second the motion. Okay, Councilor Sherman. Yes, Councilor Sherman. Uh, so, Councilor Wagner uh, read through the nine uh, requirements for us to grant an exception and then 
didn't say what the exception was that he was asking us to grant. It's the second paragraph of the materials tonight for the extension. Well, I, I think it would apply to both the first and second paragraph. Group them together. Okay. But are we going to do them I'm one at a time? Do, was that, I thought that was the earlier consensus, or did you want to do them both together? I'm fine with doing one at a time. Or okay. Yeah, we can address the, the second one first, and that's that I'll quote the firing range committee recommends that the town council grant an exception to a firing range pursuant to Article 13, Section 2413.1, as follows. Notwithstanding Article 9, Section 2491, the firing range committee, in its discretion, has the authority to grant extensions to a firing range in order for such firing range to complete registration. And I'll second that amended portion of your motion. Any further discussion? Yeah, yeah I just suggest that you read the firing range committee recommends the town grant an exception to the Swearwink Rod and Gun Club rather than the motion as stated, which is to a firing range, so that you're referencing the, the specific club. I mean, I, it, was, it was the intent to have it to a general firing range, uh, so that wasn't specific in, in this case, but uh, seeing, seeing as how there's only one, it would only be applicable uh, at this point. I, I don't have a strong feeling about that. I know Caitlin has some concerns about being too specific. Right, yes. Whatever Mike thinks is best. Hmm. Any other comments? This, these are, again, the, on the motion um, is directing the exceptions to the second paragraph. Council Chairman? I mean, I, I think it would be appropriate. We're talking about an exception being granted to the Spurwing Rod and Gun Club, yeah. which is the application in the pipeline. So if you're willing to amend your motion, yeah, if you're I, willing, yeah, I'm willing to second that. that. Okay. We can change it to. All right. Any other discussion? Council Jordan? My only issue would be separating them and not just doing them together because we're going to have to go through the findings all over again and listening to the findings and knowing the different exceptions that we're asking for. How I feel is what Jamie spoke to more directly goes to number one versus number two. So couldn't we just lump the two exceptions you're asking for together with those findings? Or, he's gonna, or are we just going to... <clears throat> verbatim those same findings for the first one. I think we'd use the same findings, but we might have to address Jessica and, and Kathy's concerns about Part B of the That's first fine, one. That's fine, then. Okay. So uh, there's a mo two, the motion's been seconded. All those in favor of accepting the, the, the findings Council Wagner has identified to the second paragraph of the proposed uh, exception language. All those in, oh, I'm sorry. No. <laughs> all, those in, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay. So back to the first section. Uh, any, any uh, I think we, I guess we should have a motion on the table to accept that. Yeah, or amend just it. procedural, yeah. I would suggest that you, you handle the, the extraneous issues that don't involve specific to the exception as a separate part C of this motion. For example, if you want, if you want to authorize a, a, uh, a, some sort of a study, you want to give any money to it, yep. I'd suggest you do that as C because it doesn't really necessarily fit in with all the findings. I think it's just right. easier to have it independent. Okay, Councilor Jordan. Procedurally, did we just vote to accept the findings only and not to issue the exception? We just agreed to grant uh, the, exception, the second exception based on the findings. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. I, yeah. you know, I, I think if anyone listened to a recording of this meeting, I think Councillor Jordan is correct. I think the, 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 the motion, and you asked, are you in favor of accepting the findings? I don't think it was a specific, I think it, it sort of contemplated the two part question. One, you know, the zoning board does this as well. You agree to the findings, and then, and then yay or nay, question. and then you yeah. agree to the motion that's part of those findings. And I, I think Councillor Jordan raises the, the point. It was, there's an ambiguity as to whether or not you did that. Okay. Would you like to make a new motion, Councilor Jordan? I, or, well, I, I think perhaps the chair could simply ask, do you all agree with the motion now? Uh, what he said. <laughs> I'm getting tired. But, you know, you asked us to approve the findings. Now you ask us to approve the motion. Is that essentially it? Okay. okay. So we had, all right. So. We just, what did we just approve then? We approved the findings. We approved the findings, okay. Is there a motion to approve? The exception. The exceptions. 
one. Paragraph two. Yes, Oops. the one exception. So who's going to move that? I move that we approve the second stated exception for the authority to grant extensions to the firing range in order for the firing range to complete registration. So did we agree to change the wording to Spur, Wink, Rod, and Gun Club yes. in that? I didn't read As that. As amended, word. yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, there, so there's so uh, I'll second that. Okay. Council Wagner. Any other, uh, Walsh, any other comment? All those in favor? <laughs> okay. It's unanimous. We have it. Okay. All right, then back to the, the, first, the first paragraph then. We, we'll finish that up. Any, any, uh, should we have a motion on the table? Or is there any more discussion before we have a motion? Co yes, Council Weiner. Well, uh, it sounded like the consensus was that maybe we should change it to say there is a completed independent safety evaluation. You know, so that we're, we're taking that onus on the town. And that just to make that. it clear, unlike in the, mm -hmm. um, Planning board process. We're not intending on charging it back to the gun club, so this would be something the town was taking on. Uh, so I would amend the, the uh, requested exception to say there is a completed independent safety evaluation. Uh, maybe with a parenthetical, um, as ordered by the town of Cape Elizabeth, or I don't know how best to phrase that. Could, could it be? Oh. I'm sorry. sorry. Go, go ahead. Jordan so if you, that's something separate. So if no. you want to oh. talk about, I mean, could it simply be performed at the request of the town? Of performed at the request. Uh, that's fine. It's the town, not the safety fire and range safety committee. Right. Town. At the request and expense. Sure. Okay. So. Yes, Councillor Picasso. I'm I'm not clear on this paragraph. Then, if we are making an exception to the ability of the code enforcement officer to approve grading building or other improvement permits are we saying now that the code enforcement officer will not be able to approve those things until we have a completed safety evaluation yeah. that has been approved by the firing yeah. range that's committee? it right you got so it so is that is the implication then that we're talking about an evaluation being done in the next, I don't know, what, 30 days? And, and if it's not done in the next 30 days, I, I had understood the reason we're here talking about this tonight was so that we could move things forward in this building season, not next July. And if we're waiting for a, an approved safety evaluation that doesn't get completed until, I don't know, six months from now, next July, then we're waiting for another some period of time. It, it seems like a lot of delay. Okay, Council Jordan. Well, not only are we asking as a firing range committee for a completed safety evaluation, but we also, and this is what I was trying to talk to about before too, is what Kathy had brought up, section B, the expert in best practices. We also want somebody to come in and say what they want to build is the best idea or the best possible safety solution for the, the range. So that goes back to what Kathy was bringing up as to whether or not it changes the language of the ordinance. And I was going to just argue that I, I don't think we're changing the language of the ordinance. I think we're just asking for an exception to allow the code enforcement officer to approve building permits if the firing range committee approves the safety evaluation and the design of the permits that the Firing range committee, the firing of the Rod and Gun Club is asking for permits to be issued for. That makes sense. We get all the way around there. Councilor Ray. So I'll go back to some of my um, concerns earlier. Um, first of all, if the town, uh, I don't know, and Mike could probably speak to this, how long it would take to have to go through the RFP and so forth, but if the town is requesting an independent evaluation, then I think that the other level that the town council approved this safety evaluation, as well as the firing range committee, I'd like to see that in place. And um, I would not be inclined to um, vote for uh, B, part B, because um, I think we're unclear as to who is requesting an expert and who is going to pay for that expert, and is this a separate request 
from the safety evaluation. Um, um, so I, I'm, I'm not clear I, that I understand what Section B is about uh, still. And, um, but I do think that it's important that if the town requires a safety evaluation that it might behoove us to have the town council approve that safety evaluation as well as the firing range committee. Um, if we're asking for it, mm -hmm. then we should have an involvement in that approval. And, and I say that because I think sometimes it's important that the more people who are saying, yes, we approve this, and the firing range committee says, yes, we approve this, that it sends a message that we have this and, you know, it's in place and, and we think that it's been done properly. I, I, I don't know. Or, may, or again, we, maybe we get back to the, the verbiage of what do we do with the safety evaluation once we have it? I don't know. Okay. Any thoughts? Let me get to Mr. Sherman next. I, I'm going to get back to a point that Molly McCausland made, which was I thought that we wanted a permit to issue soon so that the gun club could proceed with safety improvements and that they were willing to do so even not knowing what this indep independent evaluation concluded, but they were willing to take that chance because they felt strongly that their proposed improvements would make the club safer, and that was a goal that I think Jamie alluded to at the very beginning. So it, it seems to me we can grant the exception without indicating that this has to be approved by the firing range committee or the town council. We're just going to order that it happen, and we'll get into the funding of that later. But so long as that evaluation is going to happen and it's going to move forward, if we get it three weeks from now, great. If we get it five months from now, that's fine. The exception is granted. They move forward. And if they end up doing something the wrong way, then it may end up becoming more expensive. But that's what they're willing to do is what I understand. So I think all this really needs to say is that we grant the exception. The code enforcement officer can issue the permit provided that the I suppose the town has ordered that an evaluation shall occur and, and we can get into funding and all that stuff, but that this evaluation is going to happen at the request of the town and we don't have to decide who approves it. I think <coughs> implicitly in this ordinance, if that's part of the application process, the committee ultimately is going to review it mm -hmm. and if they find it somehow deficient, they're going to say why and then we'll, we'll go from there. Also, Jordan. As to address um, Kathy's concerns about it being approved by the town council as well as by the committee, the town council created a committee to handle the firing range issues, applications, safety evaluations. So maybe the way we need to word it is the town council is going to issue the firing range committee funds to get a safety evaluation a expert design person so that they're bringing the report back to the firing range committee so it doesn't have to come back to the town council for approval. It is all staying within the quasi-judicial committee the town council created to handle firing range issues. Councilor Ray. Um, so if I'm, I'm trying to understand going back to what um, um, Councilor Sherman said. The, the exception is to allow the code enforcement officer to approve the building permits. And, um, but the wording says prior to the submission of a complete application and the approval of a license, if there is a completed safe, independent safety evaluation that has been reviewed and approved by the firing age committee, and if I'm understanding what he said and I might not be, the idea is that it's ordered and gotten not approved by anybody and and maybe that's you know again we're talking about trying to move forward and I don't have a problem with the town council not approving it but if the town council is not approving it maybe the firing range is not approving it as well uh, I mean and what are we doing are we asking for the exception are we asking for the code enforcement officer to allow them to you know to issue the per the approval of the license if it's done or if it's done and approved, and by whom. So I'm a little unsure. I'm going to just take this moment and ask Councillor Sherman. My understanding was, from what you said, that, that there's essentially two separate issues. Am I right? That you are allowed, that we would make an exception, or that the committee's uh, requesting an exception that would allow the code enforcement office to approve the building, building permit. 
that's one issue. Separate issue is safety range evaluation that the town may ostensibly fund. But those, that those are two separate items. Right, I mean, it seems to me that the if is that the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club fully cooperates with a safety range evaluation to be performed at the request and expense of the town. I, I presume they would cooperate anyway. Yeah. Uh, I've heard nothing to indicate otherwise. And so if they want to get their permit, they cooperate with that evaluation that the town is going to select and pay for. Okay, and then? And then the rest we leave out. Okay, well that's, that was my next question. We leave the rest of that out so that the, the, uh, the permit, the, the granting of the building permit is not conditioned, conditional upon a completed safety evaluation being approved by the Fire Range Committee. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Do you say not conditioned on the approval? That's right. Right. Yes. I mean, the problem I have with that is that the, the Fire Range Committee, th this is the exception they're requesting, and it, if you take out the approved by the Fire Range Committee, I think it kind of guts what we're asking for. Yeah. Well, but see, I, th I think at the end of the pro the, the evaluation is going to occur. You're going to get a report. You still have to make a decision on the licensing. And if for whatever reason you don't find that range safety evaluation adequate, or you don't find that the but clubs it's, comply. It's not actually the Fire Range Committee that makes the decision on licensing. It's all of us. It comes back to us before, after a public hearing. It's just like a liquor license. They have to make an application. It's got to be a public hearing. The council has to decide whether or not to issue the license. We're, we, we're going to give you our opinion. Right. Councilor Jordan. Right, but I think the thing that Dave's trying to say is we'll, this council will disapprove allowing the code enforcement officers to issue building permits at the Rod and Gun Club's risk. They can go get the building done, get what they think is going to make it as safe as possible, and make it so that their application will go through. And then we'll get the safety evaluation. This will move it forward so that these safety improvements can happen. Should it turn out that the safety evaluation comes back negatively and what they've done is not good, then they're going to have spent a lot of money and they're going to have to spend more money if the safety evaluation requires them to do something else. It's a risk that they're going to have to take. I hear that. Uh, we will still have, sorry, we'll still have the authority as a firing range committee to not issue the license even after they've built all of this stuff if the safety evaluation doesn't match up. Council McCausland, I think you were next. Um, Jamie, do we address your concern if then we add a separate paragraph three that addresses that completed safety evaluation and the review and the approval by the firing range committee? Isn't that the intent of adding the third paragraph? That we keep that language but we separate it out from what it is we're being asked to accept with an EXCEPT, not ACCEPT, what we're asking to accept in paragraph number one. In other words, what we're asking for right now in paragraph one it says we'll let the code enforcement officer make these changes or, or get permits if there's a completed safety evaluation. And I think what I just heard in this conversation was let's separate that out so that we give the code enforcement officer the authority to make those to give those approvals and those permits, but we still want the completed safety evaluation reviewed and approved by the firing range committee. And that would get moved into the third paragraph where we would address the independent safety evaluation, what it is we're expecting to get and how we're going to pay for it. Yes. Um, Any thoughts on that comment? Does that address your concern? I, I would like to say that I think I'd like to separate the uh, the procurement of the range evaluation and how it's paid for. I'm not sure that that needs to be in that. I think, and also I think that perhaps the language about approval is is already, as uh, Councilor Jordan and Councilor Sherman have said, in, implicit in in the fire and range yeah. committee's charge. I don't think. I don't think that needs to be restated, as, as <coughs> I'm saying. Councilor Ray? That's what I was going to say, is I'm not sure that we need to restate that, because I think that's already part of their charge, that um, the, the rest of it's just implied that you're going to be doing that, because that's part of the Fire and Range Committee's charge. But our, our, our job here is tr to try to say we're ordering um, a safety evaluation, and we're 
paying for it up to X number of dollars or, or however folks want to do that and we're asking the town manager to yeah. do that and I'd, I'd also be interested in the town manager's thoughts on this because I can see we're we're struggling and having a hard time with this well one th one thought I, I'm, I'm willing to try to make a motion yay <laughs> yeah I was gonna I was gonna ask you to actually repeat what you had just said a few moments ago and if you'd like to put that in motion form uh, I'm sorry yeah. I just wanted to say one tiny little more point yeah. you know five of the council members here were voted on the ordinance as it exists I believe you weren't yet on the council right I think I was. oh you were okay. I think eight, six of us did did they not All right yeah yeah so six, yeah. so six excluding me the rest of you voted on this so if it's the will of the group that voted on this it's essentially amending the ordinance without amending it to, to change the requirement in this situation to allow the code enforcement officer to issue a permit prior to the completed application. That's, that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And that is, as Caitlin said, you know, at the, the, the gun club takes a risk because if they make these improvements and they don't, are not up to snuff, well, we eventually, after our review, they might not be issued a license. Well, they might. But, Council Walsh? Before we let David try to summarize all of this, um, I, want to, I want to go to the, the expert best practice piece. You know, I was at that meeting on Friday where this was discussed, and I think it was pretty clear that the firing committee wished to have experts to measure and evaluate the improvements that were being made outside of the process feeling that they needed to have some expert help to determine and to some degree measure whether in fact this was going to be part of an overall strategy that was the right one. So I think they were looking for, they weren't necessarily trying to create something different under the word best practice. I think they were trying to, to support the, the code enforcement officer allowing this gun club to make the kind of changes that are being made and they needed to have some expert advice. I think that's what I heard, and that's, and that's what you've engendered in this particular item. So I don't want to dismiss it on the basis that it's somehow creating some brand new instrument within the ordinance that wasn't initially intended, uh, because I think, it, the, I think their intent was pretty, uh, pretty clear um, as I witnessed the discussion. You guys may have a different point of view, but you know, so. It, is it possible to get uh, an evaluation completed uh, within the window that would make this at all helpful to, to move the permitting process along? I, mean, I, I I'm assuming these this could by the time you locate you do the RFP you locate somebody you get the evaluation that could be three to four months out. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure we would be accomplishing the goal if we yeah, did this the, the way you phrased. It. I'm just trying to figure out how to best move this along. That's all. Yeah. Councilor Jordan. I'm just going through the findings that we need to find. Um, this, in my opinion, is exactly why the exception rule was put in there. The, as <coughs> Mr. Romano, who must have been so keen on his comments because he keeps getting quoted, said, we're going around, the firing range will be stuck going around in circles. They can't make improvements <coughs> until they get an application through. They can't get an application through until they make improvements. This exception is exactly needed to put the building permits in place get the improvements, get the application through. It's all at the risk of the Ron and Gun Club. I would assume that the Ron and Gun Club would be hiring an expert or communicating with an expert so the improvements that they're making are expert worthy for that when we go to evaluate the application and the safety concerns at the Rod, at the Rod and Gun Club that it's not going to be a problem and I think maybe we will be coming back asking for more funds to hire an expert when we go to review the application if necessary. Councilor Sherman, would you like to, uh, are you ready to make a motion? I think so, if I can read my own writing by the time I get there. Uh, so uh, I would move pursuant to sections 24-13-1 and 24-13-2 for the reasons previously summarized by Councillor Wagner in the prior motion, that we grant an exception to the Spurwink Rada Gun Club as follows. 
notwithstanding Article 8, Section 24-8-1, the Code Enforcement Officer may approve grading, building, or other improvement permits prior to the submission of a complete application and the approval of a license if the Spurwink Rod and Gun Club fully cooperates with a range safety evaluation to be performed at the request and expense of the Town of Cape Elizabeth. Second it. Second. Any more discussion? Council Walsh. Process. Shouldn't we be accepting this first piece before we accept the second? Or are we going to do it like we did the last the, time? Just we have to do the findings of fact, the approve those, fact first, and then approve and then, the exception. Didn't you just, reference the findings of fact? I, I, yeah, you did. He just did. I did. He did. did. Okay. Is that you, you did reference them? Is that mm -hmm. adequate? I'm asking you to tell me. I, I didn't hear the specifics, but you incorporated them by reference. I yes. did. All right. Yeah, they, will, they will show up as part of the motion as if read. So the motion has been seconded. Any discussion? Council Wagner. Just point of process issue. Should I be voting on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, my prior recusal on. That was then. This is now. We have the ordinance. I just want to get the will and will of the council. The That's ordinance fine. is on the books. Yes. <laughs> you are okay to vote. <laughs> Any more further discussion? Council McCausland. I'm um, just. I'm a little concerned about the language about uh, making this conditional upon the Spurwink Broad and Gun Club. I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, but that they'll cooperate with us. <clears throat> I intended there to provide access to the facility because uh, I presumably they can't do the evaluation without without access to the facility. So that was the intent. Okay. Um, we could I could be happy to amend my motion so that they provide access to the facility at reasonable times. Um, I'm more comfortable with that. Okay. Uh, so I, I don't know who seconded my motion. Uh, mm -hmm. Councilor Jordan did. So instead of fully cooperates, it would be if the Spurring Rod and Gun Club provides access at reasonable times for a range for a range safety evaluation to be performed at the request of, et cetera. Do you have that? No, no, we can't talk about that. Okay. <laughs> come off the video. Video. Okay. Video accepted. Mm. So, did you accept that? Yes. Councilor Jordan, any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Wow. Okay. I think that's a record on an item. Council uh, Walsh. Um, I'd like to uh, recommend that we move uh, item 122, Roosters. Uh, up on the agenda to next the next item if that would be acceptable to the Just council Councilor Jordan not to go back to the rod and gun club but do we have to have a discussion about appropriation of funds and how we're going to do that with the independent yes. evaluation I, well I'm glad you asked because I, I was about to do that and I thought <laughs> that's what Councilor Walsh was going to ask us so if if we could take a moment um, let me ask the town manager how would we proceed you know what what the councils would like to occur. How do how does this proceed at this point with the the appropriation and the RFP? Uh, uh, well, I, you know, I, what, what was the exact wording about? I think you just said to hire someone. I don't think you provided any money to do it. The I expense of did the not. I thought we were going to pick that up. up. I thought we were going to take that up separately. Um, okay. I thought it was going to be a separate up. motion, and I I I have no idea what an appropriate allocation would be. Uh, I was sort of guessing up to ten thousand dollars, but up to five thousand dollars. Okay. Also, Jordan. Well, just now that it's not a time sensitive because the building permits can be granted. What if it's more of the council kind of gives the firing range committee authority to come back with requests for funds for us to hire an independent safety evaluation? No, Mike shaking. I think no. I would come back with the request for funds. You okay. would. The fire range, like you know, like the town center and the mm. celebration committee, there requests funds to do things. The firing range committee wouldn't request funds from the town council to do things. No, I, no. even the you know, if any committee requests monies, and particularly if it's a procurement process, you know, we we just. You know, we, we, we don't have committees issue requests for proposals. We don't have committees contract with with uh, with it's individuals. It's you know they have no standing to do so. Okay. Okay. It's it's a you know we can make it work. 
Okay, so, <laughs> Councilor Cosmo. So, rather than appropriating the money tonight, as Councilor Jordan pointed out, there's no rush at this point. Mm -hmm. Do we ask the manager to go out and do a little research on this and come no, back to us? Got that no, 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 I keep trying to avoid that. You know, re re <laughs> realistically, you know, it's going to take a week and a half to get a good, decent RFP together. And then it's going to take a couple of weeks to have it out there and people to respond. And then it's going to take a few days. You know, the council meets on October 6th Six. or whatever the date is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, realistically, it's not going to be ready. And I can come back then and ask, you know, this is what it costs you want to fund it. Okay. So you, <clears throat> so you are suggesting that we send you this a way to do that legwork and then come back to us on October 6th? Well I, well, I think that's what you've, in essence, done by the motion that you've already made, which is you, you, you I believe you approved the, uh, you know, to, to go out and have it, to, to organize getting it done, but I can't sign a contract, you know, to, to actually do it unless there's a funding source for it. And, you know, the, and what I'm expecting this would cost, it's not something that I can just, you know, grab out of another account mm. because I think it's, it's sufficient enough that, uh, and there's public interest enough, I don't want to do that too. So perhaps I wasn't clear. I think you and I are saying the same thing. Yeah. I was suggesting that you go through a process and find out what you might need <coughs> us to approve for funding. Yeah. And then you would come back to the council when you know whether Probably it's 5,000 or 10,000, whatever what it is. that number is, yes. Great. Okay. Okay. Fabulous. Now right. who's, fine. Okay, so is it, the will of the council, that it, it uh, yeah. councilor, are we moving on to 122 now? No, I just asked would the council consider moving 122 to next? We need yes. Before you vote on that, this school facilities manager is here to give a very brief report. He has been up since a little after 3 o'clock this morning with the power failure at the school. And I, I would just beg, I know what people are here for another issue, but I would just, you know, uh, beg that you, you consider letting him go first uh, before, because he, he's been up since three on municipal town business. Trying Did to roosters him. wake him up? Well, you know, <laughs> similar issue, but you know, I just, I just wanted to point that out. He's, it's, uh, and I think he could give a very brief report. <laughs> okay, I, I'm fine with that. Is, is the rest of the council Does okay that with require that? a motion? I want to get some coffee. Does that require a no, motion? No, it doesn't. Okay. Uh, no, I don't believe so. Right, I'm, yeah. fine with, I'm fine with that. Here, you can get something for me, too. And then we, we, then we would go. So we'll take 117. And then, we would, um, and then we would do roosters immediately after that? Yes. Okay. If, if yeah. Okay. So, yes, item number 117. Um, let me just make a brief introduction. I don't know most of you recall that this is something we looked into, I believe, a year and a half ago, a little more than that, to see space uh, utilization in the town. Um, how many, how, how uh, our spaces are used and reserved by citizens and non-citizens alike. One of the interesting things we found out was that um, there, had, there was at the time no means of tracking any data. Oh, sure, yeah. but there is now and we have essentially a full year of data and there, as a result there's some very interesting numbers. So Greg uh, Marles is the facilities director. He was on this committee and his department has been putting together all, they collect the data, they make, they do the scheduling. So Greg, if you would please take it from here. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm going to make it trying to short and sweet, I hope. Um, and yes, I have been here since 4 a.m., so. Uh, just to give you an idea of the slide we have up there, are the buildings we primarily book for uh, the town and school departments? Um, so you can get a, just an idea of the, the, the few properties, and this doesn't include our Field reservations are Fort Williams reservations that all come through. If I can get this thing, oh look, it's frozen up. There we go. So I want to show you some of the numbers that we actually have. We took 11 month period and we're now able to track the number of reservations. So it's from September 2013 to July 2014, we booked 8,491 different reservations throughout the town and the school department. It's a pretty substantial number. Um, of that, we average about 771 monthly reservations for our facilities. So we, we kind of took it uh, and broke it down even further. Of course, as I brought up there, we had 951 in March alone. Um, and these are, again, all of our facilities that, that we book for. 
as you can see, the community services is the, the big booking, um, 3,204. And that's internal and external reservations. And, and when I say internal, it, it's going to be a program that, say, community services offers to yoga classes, spin classes, things like that, where they have to book the facilities in order to use them. It's not their daily programs that you might have the Cape Care programs and things like that. It's these other programs that they have to actually book the space for. So 3,200 reservations alone there. The high school is 2,500. Again, internal, external. And the externals can be anything from driver ed classes to, um, and I'll, get it, I'll actually show you some of those as we go a little further in here. Let's see if I can get this thing to work the way I want it to. Hey, there we go. Um, so some of the things that we do for this, these facility updates, and, and I wanted to kind of touch upon this. We now do an annual transporta uh, excuse me, transportation, well, annual site supervisor training, and uh, they're actually contained in these particular books. We actually have handouts that go in the, for everybody. We have a refresher course. We do a whole training on how to be a site supervisor, how to manage our facilities for anybody who wants to use us. Including it now allows us to have volunteer groups, say like a little league, to have their own site supervisor where before they would have to pay a $24 per hour fee, they don't have to pay that any longer. Um, the new facility use updates also give us a flexible rate schedule. It allows us to take high use users and give them a rate more reflective of the, the volume that they use. Uh, we now take online reservations, uh, which is a, really a nice feature. And, it, and actually, if you go to that site right there, you can actually look on any individual location to see if there is a booking available. It doesn't tell you who the individuals that are booking. It will say a permit number or unavailable. But it does give you that ability to look right online. Um, the committee is made up of the, the members, as you can see here. Um, and they represent citizens, school board members, uh, libraries, superintendents, uh, attendants, like there's multiple ones, right? Um, our facility scheduler, and of course myself, athletic director, and we get together as part of a regular meeting now to go over these. What are we looking for for changes? How do we update this? How do we make it a better, flexible system? You know this thing's not working the way I want it to, right? I apologize. I think it sat here too long. So the site supervisor, we offer two different types now. And uh, Sue Weatherby's quite upset with me for taking her picture and sticking it up here. She said, I was here 40 some odd years. I don't need to have my picture everywhere. So I figured I'd put her <laughs> up there. But we offer two different types, which is a paid site supervisor now. And that's an individual who we bring in. We pay them to be the supervisor for an event that uh, may not have a a site supervisor, not a regular ongoing type event. And then we have the program volunteer site supervisor. Again, the little league coaches, the, the um, programs that, that are basically tape-based programs that don't have those kind of funds to pay those type of things. Greg, if I could just interject for a moment. This was a, a very, very exciting uh, product, I guess, if you will, of, of the facilities committee, because a lot of the, the area groups that wanted to rent, mm -hmm. you know, a space or whatever were upset that they would have to pay, and yet they would want things when after hours. And so this is a way for them to train site supervisors that don't let kids get into buildings that are locked and so forth. W without having to pay a fee, they can have training um, so that they know what the, the rules and parameters are. And this has been very successful, Greg, is well, as you can you see, we did 36 people who've done the annual training. <clears throat> Since that first training, we've had 12 additional people um, do the refresher training, which we require. On top of that, the real, over 50% of those people are the volunteer site supervisors, which I think is really an excellent thing to show because, again, those little leagues, they sh strictly run off of registration fees and what they can raise through you know donations and it's a huge deal for those kind of uh, uh, programs where they need to book a gym for indoor winter trainings that might cost them a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars when they start adding up all of the fees they now can do that there is no cost for that 
So it, it does help those programs. I apologize, my machine isn't working right. Um, again, the flexible rates. Cape Elizabeth's resident groups no longer pay fees. And that it was a big change when we went through this and updated our facility use policies. Uh, prior to the Cape Elizabeth Little League, not only would have to pay the site supervisor, but they pay to rent the facility. We don't do that for Cape-based programs, the educational, uh, see, for the Cape Elizabeth Educational Foundation or the Historical Society. Those particular groups, which are all Cape-based groups, no longer have to pay to use our facilities. Now, if they go to the point and they get a site supervisor, they don't have to pay for that either. So it's really been a great program. It, it, it has impacted some of the revenue. I, 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 you know, I'd remiss in not saying that. But that revenue was about a $3,000 annual revenue that, that was impacted by this. It's, it's, a, it's, it's not a huge fee. It's, it's, it's um, allowed us to provide these services, at a, I believe, at a better, uh, a better way for our community groups. Um, we also do a flexible uh, rates for multi-bookings, such as Coastal Maine Aqu uh, Aquatics, which use our facilities constantly. Um, the church uses our facilities. And then we also allow some flexible rates for larger groups like the Maine Senior Games, which bring in eight, 900 people to our facilities. So it really, it's given us that uh, our ability to utilize or have those groups utilize our facilities when they're, they're not being utilized. <coughs> any, any questions? Any questions for Greg? Yeah. No, I just want to say I think that the facility, the committee really worked real hard uh, over almost a year period to put this program into place, and I think it's been highly successful. Um, the, the bookings, as you can see, you know, over 8,000 bookings in a year. It's a pretty substantial amount for, uh, for a small community like Cape Elizabeth. And our, our facilities are very heavily used. <laughs> they really are. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. OK, so now on to item number 122, roosters. Uh, and before we proceed with this item, we do have an opportunity for public comment. You have three minutes apiece, and there's a total of 15 on this agenda item. Would anyone like to address the council on this item? Please come to the podium. And could we have your name and address, please? Um, my name is Crystal Kennedy, and I live at 17 Farm Hill Road. OK. Uh, I read a news article when the rooster ordinance was removed from the town ordinances that it was removed with the hopes that neighbors would talk to each other to resolve the issues instead of going to the police, for neighbors to be neighborly. Since moving to Cape Elizabeth with my kids in the spring of 2012, I have not found neighbors to be neighborly. In fact, it has been toxic and my family has been bullied. Our neighbor across the street came to our house, into our house without permission, yelling at us to make our son stop practicing his flute for a concert and drop the F-bomb in front of our kids. Our backyard neighbor threatened our kids on multiple occasions to call the police on them because they were being loud on the trampoline during the day. The one time our dog barked excessively outside due to being sprayed by a skunk, a neighbor had the police come to our door. Even the officer smelled the skunk. Our 11-year-old daughter has been bullied by older boys and girls her own age. And a boy two doors down from us admittedly peeped in her window on several occasions. Does all of this sound neighborly to you? And now this. The first complaint we heard about the roosters from a police officer was from a police officer coming to the door. Other than that, we heard on from only two neighbors. Both times were demands to get rid of the roosters rather than to try to compromise. Admittedly, the roosters were loud, even 
they even were waking us up. Their coop is right under our window. That is why we started to take measures, especially for the morning hours. We block them from going outside until we let them out, which at this point is usually eight, nine o'clock, sometimes later. We insulated and weatherproofed the coop. We gave away three roosters, and soon will be four, and that will give us one rooster, one hen out of the six chicks that we bought. And now we have a rooster collar on the way to lower Elvis's volume. We also clipped their wings to prevent them from getting over the fence, which we'll have to do on occasion. We have taken measures to appease the neighbors, but there has been no further <coughs> communication from them. In fact, neighbors had said to the press that they talked to us multiple times. That is untrue. Joe claimed he notified us of the motion for the ordinance in the meeting. That was a lie. We found through, out through a reporter. How is that neighborly? I personally don't have room in my life for liars. And can someone please explain to me the definition of what excessive noise is, what a nuisance is, or what exactly disturbs the peace? What about the barking beagle across the street, the neighbors that leave bags of dog poop hanging on our pine tree, peeping toms, or a house near the Fox's house shooting off fireworks that are actually illegal in Cape Elizabeth. Mrs. Kennedy, if you could just yep. wrap it up. Thank you. We were hoping through this process we would be able to teach our kids about community and com compromise. Now it looks as if we are teaching them about standing up for yourself and for your rights. Elvis is a pet of mine, as are the other chickens, my dog, my two cats, and my fish. And they mean a lot to me all. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Joe Gada. I live at 15 Farm Hill Road. Uh, one thing I didn't get to say last week, uh, Councillor Ray, was I appreciate you coming to the neighborhood and actually experiencing firsthand what happens during the daytime. Um, there's a stereotype of roosters that they only crow in the morning or in the evening. It's absolutely not true. This thing grows constantly throughout the day, non-stop. My wife counted 60-something times in three and a half hours one afternoon. She stopped counting because it became too absurd. Uh, you, know, you, you talk about a noise nuisance. It's, it's agreed upon that a rooster's crow is generally between 90 and 100 decibels. That's equivalent to a jackhammer at 50 feet. Imagine that all day long at 40 feet away. These houses are on a fifth of an acre. There's no room at all. Your neighbor breathes and you hear it. Your neighbor's rooster crows and you feel it in your spine. It's horrible. Um, raising backyard chickens has become very popular in recent years. I think it's great. We have chickens. We originally started out with six chicks. One of ours ended up being a rooster. We noticed it well in advance before it ever crowing and found an appropriate home for it because we did not want to bother our neighbors. We had that courtesy. And the problem right now is that Cape Elizabeth does not have anything to kind of back up what needs to happen in small areas like that. Yet every other town around us pretty much does. Biddeford, Saco, South Portland, Portland, Falmouth, Cumberland, Brunswick, and Wyndham all have ordinances that specifically ban roosters on small lots in residential areas. I'm not looking for anyone, I'm not looking to take anything from anyone. I'm looking to gain back the peace and quiet in our house that we've lost, that's been taken from us. So I would encourage you to move forward and create an ordinance that will offer people in neighborhoods like ours some protection. Nothing that affects commercial endeavors, nothing on large lots, when somebody has an ample space and an appropriate space for an animal, but protection for people like us that live in an area where the houses are close. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak? Yep, please come up to the podium. <clears throat> uh, you could 
give them to the counselor and the counselor Ray at the end and she'll pass them down. Did you want to speak to the council? Yes. Now, why don't you just hand those to her and then go ahead over to the podium. Thank you. Please give us your name and address, sir. Um, my, name is, uh, okay. my name is Patrick Kennedy and um, I live at, uh, live at 17 Farm Hill Road. Um, I have to say that, um, you know, I'm sorry. Now, I first heard of the complaint. I'll just, I'll just read from here. Um, the first uh, I heard of the complaint um, about our roosters um, was a text from my wife that the police had just shown up at, the, uh, at our door about the rooster. Um, shortly after, we got rid of two roosters. Um, a third rooster who hadn't been begun crowing loudly yet, we kept. Um, dropping the, uh, the two roosters off was very hard. Um, we had to battle the urge to turn around and get the roosters back. Um, they're pets. And um, um, the, the decibel le levels that were quoted by Joe um, Dog barks uh, are just as loud. I have a decibel meter on my phone. Um, I measured my dog and the rooster at point blank range. Um, the dog, our dog was 102. Um, the rooster was 95. Um, so, and, and the, the statement that they crow all day is inaccurate. Um, I believe that um, one of the um, town council members stopped for 15 minutes. That's not an adequate representation of the whole day. Um, in the morning, um, they begin crowing um, right now at about 6.30. Um, having said that, um, we've, um, um, let me, I, I guess I just need to go through my notes because I'm having trouble I'm very nervous. Um, so after we dropped the, the first uh, two roosters off, um, it was quiet for a few days and the chicks were unusually standoffish. Um, almost a week passed before Elvis began finding his voice. We didn't want that either. The roosters were loud when they came out of in, in the pen to crow and woke us up. Um, our large double casement window is right above the coop, about 10 feet away, open wide all summer. Our bed is about 20 feet from the coop door. Um, then also in that time, a fourth rooster began to crow um, after Elvis. Um, and uh, at first we thought that was gonna be a hen. It turned out to be a rooster. Um, and uh, you could just Finish up, Mr. Okay. Kennedy. Um, I just want to say that, um, you know, at every step along the way, we've made accommodations. When there's been a complaint, we've done something to address the complaint. Um, when it was first complained, we went and got rid of the roosters. It was heartbreaking. Um, it was in kind of a moment of equanimity that we decided to um, keep the other rooster. Um, it was very heart-wrenching for us. It was one of our pets that we had raised for a couple of months um, and watched them grow and all that. Um, and Thank you, Mr. It, Kennedy. I, um, I, I want to say one more thing. Um, Joe and I agreed on the phone that um, when he approached me at the fence at one point, um, we had an argument and I called him afterward and he agreed on the phone that um, if I quieted the rooster in the morning, which I've got it down to 60 decibels, which is the same as quiet room, that he had no problem with noise during the day. Thank you. We have your hands out and thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to this agenda item? Okay, seeing no one. Okay, uh, item number 122, it is proposed to refer to the ordinance committee a review of the potential of the town not allowing roosters to be kept on small lots. Um, is there a motion? Councilor Ray? <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd like to 
propose that we refer um, <coughs> the rooster issue to the ordinance committee to um, review um, uh, what to review the um, ordinance that has been proposed in the past and to uh, make a proposal back to the town council. Is there a second? Councilor second. Walsh? <coughs> Any discussion? Councilor Jordan? Well, the way that it's worded is it says to refer the ordinance to review the potential of the town not allowing roosters to be kept on small lots. Does that limit the ordinance committee or can it be expanded to allow the ordinance committee to review the possibility of expanding the barking dog ordinance to include roosters? Or does it, I just don't want that to be the only option that the ordinance committee has to review is banning roosters. Um, well, I would think that if you wanted to address Council Jordan, the doc, a barking dog ordinance, then you probably would have to make a second rep uh, recommendation for that to be an agenda item. I, I don't know. No, I I'm want. Wondering, it's want, a separate ordinance already. Wait, I'm not talking. I'm just referencing the barking dog ordinance. I'm to create an ordinance that could be called a crowing rooster ordinance. The way it's worded, to me, it seems like you limit the ordinance committee to only look at banning roosters from small lots. I'm asking if the ordinance committee can expand their view to looking at creating an ordinance that is a crowing rooster ordinance similar to that what we have for a barking dog. So like if the owners of the rooster are able to obtain this collar that does quiet the rooster, therefore removing the loud crowing, hence similar to a barking dog, people get dog collars that keep the dog from barking, they still get to keep the dog. Can we create an ordinance similar to that? Okay, I see, I see what you're saying. Did, just have a question for Council Jordan. Does the barking dog ordinance that we have now on the books in, uh, reference anti-barking collars or anything like that? I don't believe so, I don't know. Okay. I just know we have a barking dog ordinance. I think it would be pretty standard to we, 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 have a, if you might, we have a separate dog ordinance, and within that is a paragraph that specifically prohibits uh, loud, continuous barking dogs and allows the animal control officer to take certain actions. Okay. Councilor Sherman, you had your hand. Yeah, I mean, I mean actually, Councilor Ray's motion said something different than what's on the materials. It was to go back and review the prior ordinance that had been proposed and see if they want to refer that, that back to the council. but. I recall that the prior ordinance it's dealt with more than standard. just roosters. So I'm just wondering if we might amend this motion to refer to the ordinance committee a review of the potential ordinance amendments that may be enacted to regulate roosters and just leave it broad enough so that that ordinance committee can look at that old ordinance from 2011 if it wants, which I hope it doesn't, but it may, uh, or, or uh, tying it to the size of the lot or tying it to the nuisance ordinance. But I, I've, I, I'm willing to give the ordinance committee working with the town planner discretion to look at all options and then refer back to us what they think would be the best. Okay. And that's Councilor fine. Ray. I just, when I was reading through this, I, it sort of was, I didn't want it to sound like it was a double negative kind of thing, and, and so I was sort of struggling with how that wording should go. So okay. I'm, I'm fine with that amendment. Okay. Councilor Sherman, would you repeat your... I'm sorry. <laughs> um, that I just am asking that the motion be amended to refer the issue of uh, regulating roosters through our ordinance to the Ordinance Committee. Okay. Is there a second? Councilor Wagner. And Council Walsh, did you have something you wanted to? Uh, from process, shouldn't Kathy be amending this and seconded? Because there's already a motion out there. Okay. First and seconded, sure. rather than a brand new first and a brand new second. I, I just whatever. So I, I think she could just incorporate my suggested language in her motion. Original. So moved. <laughs> and seconded. Well, I, okay. So so. Just whoever seconded yeah. it first. Right. Okay, if you get that. Thank you. Okay. Any further discussion? I just want to yeah. Council. I think that's a that's a good compromise because I, I I agree with Caitlin that you kind of should treat this as a noise issue and a nuisance issue, not a specific animal issue. You know. So, and I think we can do that with addressing roosters specifically, but 
you know, ultimately, we're talking about incessant or overly loud. It's not that roosters are bad per se. You know, it's, you know, I used to have a rooster when I was a kid, you know, in the summertime. <laughs> you know, so I've got probably all kinds of them. <laughs> but there, there's nothing inherently bad about a rooster, but in proximity, it certainly can be a nuisance. All right, anything else? Council Wall. I don't know when Chairman Ray intends to have the next ordinance committee meeting, but I invite all of you to come and talk to us about your thoughts on this subject because we need any and all input. Um, so I just I, I don't know when you're planning to have this meeting, but boy, I'll tell you, you know, come on down and talk to us. Well, usually what happens is uh, the town planner watches the, um, the town council meeting and then I get an email the following morning saying, are you available this date, this date, or this date? So, <laughs> so it'll be scheduled soon. I expect that that's what will happen yeah. again. Good. Okay. Is there, we have a second on the table. Is there any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous, and we'll move on to the ordinance. Yes, Actually, yeah, sorry. Didn't I didn't vote. How exciting. Oh, you didn't vote? No. Sorry. All those in favor? Let me repeat the vote. All those opposed? Okay. I thought, I, I thought your hand went up. Six to one, and Council Jordan opposed. Me. Okay. All right, item number 118. Oh, I'm sorry, item number 116. We're kind of jumping around. <laughs> This is the short, the status report on short-term rentals. Um, I'd like to turn this over just a moment to uh, the town manager, and he can introduce. Uh, yeah, uh, Ben McDougall, the code enforcement officer. I don't know if this is, is this your first official appearance before the council? Second? First. First. So we'd like to welcome him being here. Uh, he's uh, been working with the short-term uh, rental uh, ordinance. One of your goals was to ask for a report. And he's here to provide a report and a little bit of background. Good evening. Uh, it's been almost two years since the short-term rental standards were adopted. In my opinion, the implementation of the standards have been relatively successful. Uh, as you can see from the survey results, uh, some residents would like to see some changes to the standards, and other residents think they are fine as is. And uh, I'm here tonight to answer any questions you have about the implementation of the short-term rental standards. Well, I noticed in uh, your report, it looks like that overall, as, as the code enforcement officer who's been dealing with this, that you were generally satisfied with everything. But I did see the one sort of comment that you, were, uh, that you made about a potential uh, relook and change would be the annual renewal. Am I correct? Is that the one thing that you're thinking, you know, maybe we should look at that? But in other, other than that, are things, things seem to be going well? Yes, I, I, I would agree with that. Uh, the, the annual renewal is, was, was somewhat taxing this year, and, and I see it being taxing every year. It's just we, we have to chase people. We'll send out a letter in January, and then a few months later, We'll send out a letter, and then we'll call people, and then towards the end of the year, there'll they'll be stragglers who then we have to begin enforcement on. So we have sort of this never-ending <clears throat> cycle of, of chasing people every year, and, uh, and I don't see the benefit, the, the real benefit. It's, it's not very much money that the town gets from the renewal process. Uh, so, so I don't see the real benefit of the renewal process. It's just the, the, uh, the, the owner has to fill out a very simple one-page application and, and pay a $50 fee. But the whole process of chasing people was, was a bit burdensome this year. Okay, Council Ray? Yeah, I think he, Walsh would come so Council uh, Walsh. I, 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 had, I had two questions. So in the report, you indicated that uh, there was some feedback about the cost associated with the safety requirements that people had to install in order to qualify for a permit. Um, do you know any idea what the costs were in some of those cases that the burden that was placed on that particular landlord or homeowner? I, I, I think some people paid upwards of $800. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think one person in the yeah. survey said 900 okay. okay. So, and it was really more exterior lighting or the lighting component that wound up being the big... Yeah, the, the, the lighting, uh, interior egress lighting. Yeah, that was the big... And, uh, and hard, hard wiring, egress lighting, and smoke detectors. Okay. So it's a, a, a 
yeah. electrical costs. All right. And then the second question is you have one substantiated uh, situation that exists today. Correct. And that's moving through, I know we have a process for that as well, and that's moving through that, that normal process yes. at the moment? Yep, that, that has moved through the process. I, I met with the manager of the rental property and, uh, we, and we came to an agreement. Uh, the, the ordinance specifies that within five days of a substantiated complaint, uh, I meet with the owner or manager of the property and we come to an agreement on what, what, uh, what procedures will happen in order for, for this not to happen again. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we have a written agreement uh, for additional uh, procedures that he will take in order to ensure that the violation doesn't occur again. And that substantiation process, in your opinion, worked the way it was designed in that ordinance? I know that we, we had a lot of discussion about the number of strikes, three strikes and you're out, and a lot of that. When we were developing the process, did it work the way it's supposed to work in your yeah, <clears throat> the, the first substantiated complaint, it, it's essentially a warning. Uh, I have the authority to suspend the, the short-term rental permit for up to 30 days, uh, depending on the violation. I did not feel this was an egregious violation. It was, uh, it was a very quiet family party with no consumption of alcohol, 25 people. Uh, that was that was the police report. So, uh, had it had it been a different style violation, I, I may have chosen to suspend the permit. But it was a very mild manner mannered party. But they did exceed the number of people they could have at the party and the number of mm -hmm. cars that can be parked there. So it is a complaint, and and the process worked very well for this. If if a property gets a second substantiated complaint the short-term rental permit is suspended for a minimum of 30 days. And, uh, and that is going to be an interesting process from an enforcement perspective, because we have houses that uh, are you know, renting for $5,000 or more per week. They've signed contracts with people well in advance. Uh, so, those houses have a lot on the line. To, to, if, if they're suspended for 30 days, they're looking at directly losing $20,000 of income and the breach of contract for those four weeks. They've promised four people vacations in that house. So there, it's going to be a, a major legal issue when we get a second substantiated complaint and suspend a permit for 30 days, it's, it's, it's going to be a, an interesting legal process through that. Hmm. And, we, and I haven't encountered it yet. Council Jordan? Um, does a, a, obtaining a permit right now require site plan review? No. And if you are a new home and suddenly want to have short-term rentals, would you have to go through site plan review? No. And why? I'm trying to follow the logic of the zoning. I mean, I'm not in favor of it, but I just think the way we put it in there, it might. I mean, under site plan review, it says activities requiring site plan review are any non residential expansion or change in use. And if you go back where short term rentals are listed under non residential use, I'm just wondering if we put it somewhere in the wrong place and it does require site plan review, which I'm not saying it should. I just <clears throat> see perhaps since we're reviewing the ordinance, there might be a little issue in the placement of it. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't looked at it that way, but I can, I can research that and let you know if I think that's a conflict. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, also right. Um, I hear what you're saying about, you know, chasing people down um, and, you know, trying to make sure that it's done on an annual basis. But then part of me says, but if you don't do that, does it not tell, um, I mean, do, are you suggesting that they have a, a permit um, for a X period of years? Um, because I'm wondering if, 
you know, part of me says, I, I hear what you're saying, and then the other part of me says, but if we're not making sure that we're on top of this, does that not send a message that we're sort of <clears throat> being more lax and not paying attention to the details? And I don't know, I'm asking the question. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, currently it says you renew your permit you, you go through the whole inspection procedure every five years and you renew right. your permit every year. Mm -hmm. And uh, Are you suggesting every five years for the renewal of the permit? That it, it could be done that way or that could be shortened up to three years where there's just a, a wholesale permit renewal every three years to, to meet in the middle. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not it, it's not an outlandish administrative burden if we renew this thing every year. It, it's just a it's a point of the ordinance that uh, it is it taxes staff time a bit, and and I haven't seen the benefit yet of, of that. Okay, thank okay. you, Councilor Jordan. What was your thought on? I saw a couple of comments on just having a registration instead of a permit required. I mean, as Kathy just said, aren't we trying to stay on top of it? My question back to her would be, what are we trying to stay on top of? I mean, we've created an ordinance that has rules. Is the permit process just obtaining the contact information, which could maybe just be done through a registration process? Well, I, I think the, the re-inspection would, would be for the building standards to, because the, you know, smoke detectors may have been removed, fire extinguishers may, you know, may have been misplaced. So I believe that that was probably the intent of the reinspection was for the building code issues. We don't require homeowners to have all of those inspections, do we? Uh, I mean, for just having your home. I mean, we don't require those things in a normal home, which is what people are renting yeah, well, out. For, for renovations, uh, you know, we, we require smoke detectors and carbon monoxide you do. if a house is renovated. Okay. Councilor Sherman? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't want to go back and debate the old ordinance, but I think the point of the, the, those safety requirements was that if you're going to rent to short-term renters, it's important that we have those in place. But I guess what I'm hearing from you is that if you had your druthers, the ordinance committee might take another look at this and say, maybe we don't have to renew the permit every year. It could be every other year, and maybe every fourth year you got to go through the, the entire submission process again. So I, I, I don't really know what, it didn't sound like this anything pressing, but maybe at some point we uh, send this issue back to the ordinance committee to just take a look at that particular issue. Yeah, it's, cer it's certainly not a pressing issue yeah. that I'm coming here and asking you to tackle it. Uh, it's, it's just an observation. Councilor Jordan? Sorry, uh, this was <laughs> obviously I, I didn't favor the short-term rental ordinance to begin with, so I was keen on the fact that we promised we would revisit in a year, and it's almost taken two. Um, but what I'm more interested in is the comments of how most people who were gung-ho about an ordinance really didn't get the satisfaction that they were looking for. And, it, and listening to Ben's report, it, it seems like it didn't achieve what it was set out to do. And so now we have this extra burden on citizens who do do short-term rentals having to go through getting a permit. And so I'm just wondering if we are holding true to what we said almost two years ago about reviewing whether or not the ordinance was going to be continued and necessary if that is being done now at this process or if we're just going to push it forward forever. Well, I'd, I'd like to point out that there, there's a reason why, why we have waited for this data. I mean, it wasn't just a two years because people weren't doing things. I mean, we had, the, we had the ordinance created. We had a new code enforcement officer. You know, it took time to get the survey out, to get the survey results in. I don't know if the town manager would like to speak to that a little bit on how we, you know, the process was. I think, I think the staff and the code enforcement officer has done the due diligence of no, putting this together. No, you know, I think the staff was very clear. We, we informed the council more than six months ago, a year ago, that it, it, last year was just too new into the experience. We didn't have enough experience. And we indicated that we wanted to go through a second year of people applying for the permits. And, you know, 
that's, I think, the earliest possible time to get good, relevant feedback was to do it after they had gone through both a, an initial permit and a renewal. And, you know, I think we're very open with the council doing that. I make no apologies for, for having presented it when we did. Uh, you know, the council didn't ask for a citizen survey. We went out and we sent out, you know, over 500 surveys to citizens to get their input. So, you know, I, I make no apologies for uh, the thoroughness of this report uh, or for the, for the fact that we, we really sought meaningful public input. Uh, I think we did, and I, I just, uh, I, th I think, you know, the, 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 the criticism I keep hearing over and over at different meetings that, you know, we should have done this earlier, we should have done this earlier, I just don't agree with it. Uh, I, uh, I think it, as a result, we have much better recommendations with a lot more citizen input. Council Wagner, do you have? Um, ben, does this ordinance address um, Airbnb at all? Do they have any application to Airbnb? Uh, n not directly. It, the, the ordinance does say that uh, one rental, uh, let's see, one rental agreement, uh, only one rental agreement can be entered into for seven days. So it doesn't, I know Airbnb, you can, you know, every night you could have a different person. It's almost like a hotel, right. more like a hotel. But this ordinance does prevent that. If you let someone stay for one night, then under this ordinance, that constitutes a week. No, no one else could stay for the next six days. Right, and the follow-up on that question, have you had any complaints from citizens about Airbnb in town? Because I know there are some. No. No, I haven't. Well, I, I would like to uh, commend you and the staff because I thought that the approach with the survey of asking uh, questions and opinions of not only the renters, the short-term rentals owners, but the abutters as well, I think, I think was handled well. And I, I thought the comments were fascinating and I, I think the percentage numbers, you know, are, are generally quite positive. I mean, there are, there are people that are unhappy, but overall, um, I think that it, it seems to be effective and reasonably fair. But I, I just think that the, the design of the survey and the questions, I think that you and whoever else helped you with that uh, should be commended because I thought it was very comprehensive and I thought the questions were well, well put. So, Councilor Ray? Um, I would echo what um, Chairman Sullivan said. I know that um, the Ordinance Committee spent a great deal of time, as did um, staff, um, yourself and um, police chief and um, the town planner. And, um, you know, it was sort of a first of its kind kind of thing. Not first of its kind, but first for us. And um, we, we worked really hard to try to put together something that we hoped would work. And after reading all the comments and stuff, of course there's comments that are on polar opposites. Um, but I, uh, my sense was that it was overall working fairly well. And if we need to tweak it, then we need to, you know, tweak it here and there. And, um, but I was actually very pleased. And I read through every piece of it. And, and you know, people were, it, the comments were interesting. Um, and it seemed to me that it was doing what we had intended for it to do. So mm -hmm. um, I, I was pleased, and I, I thank you and the rest of the staff for what you did to do it, and especially with them sending out those, um, those questionnaires, because we could sit here and say, well, I think, I think, I think. But to actually hear from the short-term renters and the neighbors. Um, and, and, you know, some of the comments that were made, um, I, when I read through them, I thought, well, I don't think this is particularly an ordinance issue. I think this particular issue may be a police issue. Um, so there were people that had made some complaints about various things, but it wasn't an ordinance issue as much as it might have been a neighbor issue or a police issue. So um, I didn't really take a lot in consideration that that was a failure of the ordinance. So thank you. Welcome. And, and I'd point out that the police department's been very helpful in the implementation as well. They've been more than willing to address 
the complaints and take the necessary information when they visit houses why, on nights and weekends. And that's why it was so important that we had the police department involved, mm -hmm. because we, as, as the ordinance committee, we would come up with some things and Neil would say, okay, but you need to understand that this is how this is going to play out or this is, you know, so that was really important that we involve the different departments that were going to be in, involved in, you know, enforcing it, so. Any other comments? So I would, Councillor Watt, is that a hand up or not? No. Okay. okay. <laughs> so I would like to thank our code enforcement officer, Ben, for his report, and I would entertain a motion to accept the report with thanks for all the work done. Council so moved. Seconded. Councillor McCausen. Any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Okay, next item is number 118, pay classification plan. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, the town manager and the finance chair to just discuss this. Uh, you probably you saw this in your packet. Um, and um, let me let, ask Mike to start, and maybe Jim can chime in. Or would you like go to first, or do you want me to? Well, I, I, as a way, a little background on this. I mean, this is something that uh, any good organization is going to do on, a, on a, a periodic basis to look at the marketplace and, and figure out where we are in relationship to our peer communities. And um, I know that uh, in, the, in the business world, one subscribes to a human resource group and you, you offer your information about your pay grades to it and then it's shared within your peer groups and you never really know who it is that you're getting information about. And um, what Michael has done is a pretty a, a yeoman's job of digging into this detail because it isn't quite as accessible as one might think. So while he has, uh, has really uh, got a great relationship with these communities, what you have in front of you is, um, is really um, uh, sort of you know, in the moment, real time uh, data. And I think that the way that Michael's gone about presenting it, at least to, to present to, to Jessica and myself, is very similar to what you may have seen in, in your own world in terms of the midpoint within the range and plus or minus 15%. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an absolutely fabulous document that way. And I think that we found ourselves in much better shape uh, than uh, we originally thought, and I think it answers some of the questions we have when we go through the budget process about where are we in relationship to our peer groups, and when we hire in a brand new uh, director or a brand new assessor or a brand new code enforcement officer, where do you stop them in the range uh, so as to make sure that they're being paid fairly, but also that we're paying at a market rate that's important um, in terms of retaining good good quality professionals in a town that demands a high level of service. So I, I have to tell you, I mean, uh, I, I had no idea what to expect, but it was a, a very um, enlightening um, couple hours with Michael, but there were hours spent leading up to what you see in front of you. So as a backdrop, um, I'll turn it over to Michael, but I think uh, I'm very, uh, very impressed with what, what has been presented to us. and. Um, and one that I'm, I'm happy to share with the council tonight through Michael. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jim. I just want to add is, you know, we, we looked at the communities that, that I mentioned here uh, that we ended up listing as comparable, Cumberland, Falmouth, Freeport, Gorham, Standard, Yarmouth. But we also had data available for at least 15 other communities that, that the council chairman and the finance chair saw. Uh, and then, you know, and we looked at each position. The midpoint is simply derivative of what the, what the average was for those communities I just mentioned. Uh, that's how you arrive at the midpoint, and I think it, otherwise Jim explained it well. Uh, as we, we look at new hires for these, for these positions, we'd be looking below the midpoint, uh, unless it was someone that was really experienced or we had a, a, a special need in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and uh, you know, we also look at the midpoint as, as a guide for the pay of uh, all of our different employees. Okay. Any comments? Uh, is there a motion to accept 
the uh, town manager's update of, of the pay, pay classification plan. Bef before we move that, um, Michael, did you want to s explain the 10,000 that we have that one comment in your oh, in your yeah. cover note? The variant. Yeah. Just to, just to let people. Yeah. Just about every year, I think, you know, every year for the last 15 or 20, there's a little bit of money included in the budget in case we see a variance that we need to make exceptions, uh, that we need to, to make sure that we're competitive. Uh, if it's someone who reports directly to the town manager, I need to get approval of the, both the council chair and the finance chair uh, in order to make an adjustment. Uh, if, it's, if it's someone that a department head, the, the numbers identified, wants to make an adjustment to, uh, they need to get the one over one approval for me as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councilor McCausland. Um, could I ask manager a quick question on the um, proposal to utilize a consultant to review the job descriptions and pay levels at the library? Um, do we have experience doing that in the past? I know in the, in the, since I've been on the council, we've talked a little bit about uh, the need for some human resources consulting. And we yeah. talked earlier in the year about the possibility of an HR person yeah. at some point coming on board. Um, I guess I have two questions. One, do we have a consultant to use? And number two, do, we have, do you need money appropriated to hire that consultant? Um, and then I'd ask a separate question of the um, chair of the council about um, how we might move forward in the future about discussing the possibility of the need for HR services on a broader basis in the future. The council included $25,000 in the budget uh, for HR services for us to go out and, and get the needs where we need to, either from an HR consultant or from attorneys that could, could help us with particular issues. So, mm -hmm. Uh, the money's are already there. I think, you know, the difference between Cape Elizabeth and other places is what you have here, most other communities would have hired a consultant to do the whole thing. Uh, we have narrowed it down simply to, to do the library, and the library is unique because of all the different changes that we have, and uh, the, the job descriptions just, there just doesn't seem to be any consistency community to community, or at least that, that I can see or that I understand. So we, we need to go outside. But we have the monies there. Uh, we'll be advertising very soon for a consultant to do this. Wanted to give this report to you first uh, before we did that, but we are going to be looking for someone to do a pay study specifically uh, for libraries. But you know, part of that is as well is to make sure the job descriptions at the library are up to snuff. And uh, you know, and, and quite frankly, you know, I'm probably going to wait on this until after November. This is a big issue happening in November with the library, so. You know, like the, in, you know I, I think we need to know the outcome of that vote before we finalize exactly the physician's description <clears throat> and other things that we need to look at. Sure. And so and my second question about the future needs for HR, maybe bring it up as a council goal for next year when we look at that in December? Yeah, we could do that. We could uh, uh, see how this process goes with the funds that are allocated already for a consultant. We could uh, discuss it, you know, at budget time. I mean, that's, that would be a budget issue, but, or perhaps put a workshop in the future. Um, so. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Any other comments? Is there a motion to uh, accept the town manager's A classification plan update? Council Walt. So moved. Is there a second? Councilor McCausland, any more discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Okay, number 119, the capital stewardship plan. Uh, at our request, the town manager has submitted a proposed capital stewardship plan for the next 10 years. Mike, would you like to just? Yeah, it's, you know, one of the council goals is that every year we, we look at our steward, our capital needs for infrastructure. Uh, for, our, for our buildings, for uh, just other things that might particularly impact the budget, and uh, worked with department heads uh, to come up with a listing of the needs for the last 10 years. We've looked more specifically at the needs for this coming year, and you know that you know this is one of the first inputs in the budget. It still might be adjusted somewhat between now and and uh, when the budget's it's done. But uh, 
you know, I think it, uh, you know, is, is a good guide as you look at, you know, your future mm -hmm. budgets. Uh, the, the stewardship plan doesn't commit you to do anything. Uh, it's simply a, a, a planning resource. Uh, and I, I do want to mention that, in, and it's in the, the cover note as well, that we, we have concerns with the transfer station and recycling center area. Uh, that was opened in 1977, 1978. Uh, you know, 36 years ago, and we were about to make a, a, you know, there was a proposal to make a major investment next year in uh, replacing the hopper. And, you know, before we do that, I think we, we really need to have someone come in and look at the whole property. Uh, you know, we, we're seeing, you know, just the, the traffic over there is a mess. It used to be people would go in, they'd back in. Uh, now everyone is all over the place, they're backing in, they're going in they're front in. two, they're walking across the parking lot, and someone's going to get killed there. Uh, so I, I really think we need to have it looked at. You know, maybe we need a, a system where there's a conveyor belt that people drop their trash off, and it then goes into a hopper. Uh, you know, we have, contra I think more so than any, any other community, we have contractors who are using the transfer station, whereas the other communities, they go directly to Eco Maine. Uh, and, you know, everyone, you know, feels, oh, it's, I'm entitled to go there. But, you know, they go, in, they go in there, and that's one of the reasons why we have so many people who won't back in and won't do anything else, because these other vehicles are in there for such a long period of time. Uh, so, anyway, it's an issue you're going to hear more about, uh, and it is proposed in next year's budget to actually fund 25000 uh, for a study. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments? Any further comments on it? I, I'd like to thank you for putting this together. Uh, I think it's going to help us tremendously in uh, plan our budget and all our concerns about revenues and expenses and what we need to do. It's going to be a, a great resource to keep referring back to. And I, I appreciate all that you've done to put, put this together. Council Walsh. And at uh, Council Chair. Jessica's uh, recommendation, we've uh, shared this updated capital stewardship plan with the uh, chair of the school board as well as the finance chair of the school. And we've asked them to look at their stewardship plan and update it, prioritizing it going forward. And hopefully we're going to get some feedback on that in the next several weeks. But showing them exactly what we've done, especially our five-year uh, fiscal plan as well, uh, we shared both of those documents, again, as an example of, uh, you know, how we can sort of kind of do a little bit of forward thinking in terms of what we're doing and prioritizing the things that need to be looked at as a community. So, thank you. Thank you. Councilor Ray? I move that we accept the capital stewardship plan for 2016 to 2025. We approve, excuse me, not accept, approve. Is there a second? <coughs> Councilor Sherman? Second. Any more discussion? Oh, Councilor Coughlin? I would just like to say that I thought that was excellent work, and I was glad that you asked to have it done, and thank you to the manager for putting it together. I thought that was great. Thank you. Anything else? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Item number 120, public hearing on the town center plan adoption. It's proposed to schedule a public hearing for Monday, October 6, 2014 at 7 p.m. on consideration of adoption of the 2014 town center plan draft from the town center Com planning committee. Um, uh, the town planner's not here, but Councilor Sherman. I was simply going to say that I would move uh, <laughs> that we schedule the uh, the consideration of the adoption of the 2014 center, Town Center Plan uh, for a public hearing on Monday, October 6th at 7 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Ray? Any, any discussion? Councilor Ray? Just wanted to thank um, Councilor Sherman for um, working with the uh, wording changes that we all were sort of throwing at him during the workshop, so he managed to pull that off. I, I'm not sure I deserve credit for this. Uh, isn't this, no? Mm. No, I think you, you summarized at the end of our, our deliberations that it seems to me you could make this minor change and 
Right. Yeah. Oh, and oh. It, yeah, yes. you, you, were, you closed, shall we say, you closed the discussion and moved it. I think which I was is, here. Uh, <laughs> which you noted for. It may be that it's getting late. Not which is what you just did. Okay. Faded. Okay. All right. Okay. Just take credit, Dave. I'll take, yeah. Take thank credit. You. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> All those, oh, we have a second. All yeah. those in favor. It's unanimous. Okay, item number 121, public hearing on tax increment financing district. It is proposed to schedule public hearing for Monday, October 6, 2014 at 7 p.m. on consideration of approval of a tax increment financing district for the town center. Is there a motion? So move. <laughs> Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Do we want to thank anybody for moving? No, I'm sorry. No. Yeah. Okay, that's unanimous. And now I believe uh, we have citizens. Uh, no citizens' presence that might speak on the items not on the agenda. So on item number 123, we have uh, an executive session request. Is there a motion to go into executive session? Councilor Sherman? Yes, I move that we enter into executive session to discuss an application for poverty abatement uh, and to begin the annual process for evaluation of the town manager pursuant to Title I of the Maine Revised Statute, Sections 4056A and 6F. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. It's the time, 9.50. We won't be coming back on TV, but you may come out.